Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back. We are still in the midst of a sweltering heat wave here on the East Coast. Uh, I'm not sure uh, how far up and down the coast it goes, but it's sure hot here, which reminds me that I have just a few more weeks left of this uh, crazy heat before I can return to our uh, my office, which is my preferred streaming location. Um, We'll be doing that shortly, and I have done some work in there in the meantime while we uh, were here streaming from an alternate location in my house due to the heat. So tonight, friends, uh, we are starting a new series on these UFO insiders. Uh, when you begin to really dive deep into the subject of UFOs, you find that there is a multitude of interesting characters who claim that they have inside knowledge of what the government really knows about UFOs. Many of these UFO insiders have uh, certain traits in common, but we'll discuss that later tonight. Interestingly, I uh, tend to have a certain methodology when evaluating these, I'm going to call them, quote, UFO insiders, unquote, or so-called UFO insiders, I have a certain methodology I use to evaluate them. First of all, uh, I fact check their claims whenever at all possible. Sometimes uh, their claims are so out there that it's simply impossible to fact check. Uh, however, in the, the case of tonight's subject, uh, he dropped enough names that you can go and fact check him on many statements that he has made. Uh, so tonight, to start our UFO Insider series, we'll be listening to uh, some talks given by one David Adair. If you're unfamiliar with him, David Adair essentially claims to be a genius, a science genius, a genius with rockets. He's called the original rocket man. By him, I have never heard anybody else call him the original rocket man, save for his uh, sometimes employer, which is, of course, Gaia. Yes, my friends, David Adair has been on Gaia TV multiple times. And you know, all of you know, how I feel about people that are on Gaia TV. In fact, that's part of my methodology uh, in evaluating so-called UFO insiders. One of my general rules is if a person is on Gaia TV, they're full of shit. <laughs> but we're going to see exactly. Uh, we're going to get a taste. I'm going to give you a, quite a taste of David Adair. So essentially, David Adair, he claims that he it was uh, some sort of science whiz kid who won all these science fairs and awards. And I'm not sure why we should care that he, as a child, won science fairs. Uh, but I've always felt like this was part of his, uh, you know, prover maneuver. Like, see, I'm smart. Look, I won science fairs when I was in high school. Well, I, myself, and many other people that I know have won science fairs in high school. It doesn't make us uh, a genius. Uh, it makes us perhaps smart or interested in science, but it doesn't make us a genius. Um, you know, I was thinking today about uh, one science fair in high school that I won. Uh, you know, honestly, all the other entrants, uh, everybody else that put something in the science fair was stupid, you know? <laughs> so I felt like I just won because mine was at least well thought or, you know, a good presentation on the subject matter. I, you know, anyway... Generally, what I have observed about Mr. David Adair is that his only proof for all of his claims is that he won awards as a child. And there are, there does exist some uh, newspaper articles about him building model rockets. Um, and maybe one of the reasons that I was at all interested in David Adair is because he claimed that he, um, you know, had some sort of super advanced rocket engine that he first built as a child. And I grew, growing up, built model rockets. 
In fact, right here, I have a few boxes here uh, of old model rocket engines. I, I I just checked, and I have the igniter, you know, that you, the button you push to make the rocket go, the electric igniter. I've got a bunch of uh, old rockets that I've built. There are then newspaper articles about David Adair as a child building model rockets. Uh, but let's be clear here. Uh, that doesn't make him a UFO insider, and it also doesn't make him a genius. Now, <clears throat> I'm not trying to be uh, too self-loathing here, but if I could figure out how to make a model rocket, anybody can. I was no genius as a child. Uh, if you talk to my father, I was a dumbass. But, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a little perplexed by David Adair because he makes all of these absolutely fantastical stories uh, or statements. And he, one thing you'll notice about him, anytime you hear him speak, it is very self-aggrandizing. In other words, he's a genius and he's super important. And all these super rich people in the tech sector are very interested in his incredible work. But there are some problems with these claims and we'll get into that. First, uh, I'm going to put up my fair use banner, uh, which uh, I need to do here. So we want to remind everybody that this, these uh, images and the website we'll be sharing and the videos that we'll be sharing tonight are covered under fair use. We are educating the public about this so-called UFO insider named David Adair. We need these materials in order to educate the public. We'll be uh, playing clips from those videos and uh, reading from this website of one of his employers. Uh, but uh, we'll be discussing and critiquing the information we're sharing as well as using it to educate the public. So this, my friends, is the definition of fair use. We're citing fair use here. Uh, and fair use, when used for educational purposes, tips the balance in the favor of the fair use user. So I said my piece on fair use. Lately, we have had a great number of stupid false copyright claims, and then I have to file all this legal paperwork, and it's such a huge hassle, especially considering that some of our videos aren't getting huge number of hits. It's just not worth it to me. So I'd like to put it out there right in the beginning. This is fair use. All right, so we'll go. This is a public website, by the way, too. Uh, it's it's Gaia TV, but I wanted to start with that because there's some incredible claims right, right in his so-called biography. It says, David Adair, my story, child prodigy to rocket science. And uh, it's interesting that David Adair has spoken at all the biggest UFO conferences. Here we have an ad from Conscious Life Expo. He has talked at Contact in the Desert and many other of the huge, big UFO conferences. Okay, so uh, here on the Gaia TV website, remember they have uh, him as a guest on their network many, many times. And just a note that we have seen the terrible job that Gaia does vetting their so-called insiders. Look at the terrible job they did vetting David Wilcock and Corey Goods. Bull, you know, so anytime somebody's on Gaia TV, instantly I think these people are not, that person is not credible. Because I have not found one credible, believable person with facts and evidence that can back up their stories on Gaia. Mostly, all you find on Gaia is storytelling hucksters uh, with no proof, like Corey Good did a TV show for what is it, two or three years, telling stories about time travel and battling reptilian aliens in space. What's his proof? Trust me, dude. David Adair is very similar. I don't see any proof here. I don't see any factual evidence that I can confirm that backs up his stories so far. So it says here he often received his advanced scientific inventions in dreams. Dr. Stephen Hawking on meeting David allegedly told him that he also got his ideas while dreaming. It's important to note that if you listen to David Adair, he somehow claims to have met and attached himself to and woven into his story an incredible amount of very important historical figures, especially in the fields of science. 
here we have his own biography. He's claiming that he met Dr. Stephen Hawking. Now, what does that mean? Because I, if I felt like going over to England or wherever Stephen Hawking was living at the time, uh, you know, before his, he passed on, I could have attended a lecture that Dr. Stephen Hawking gave or a book signing and met Dr. Stephen Hawking. The fact that he, if, if he, even if he did meet Stephen Hawking, it doesn't prove all of these fantastical claims that he's going to make. And we'll get into that. Now, uh, here we have uh, more. It says David shares his ordeal of being forcibly taken to Nevada's Groom Lake, Area 51, as a teenager, along with his latest rocket prototype. He describes the alien engine that he examined under the base and how he kept his knowledge and rocket from being used by the United States government. Is David a crazed UFO whistleblower that fancies himself a rocket science? Or was he involved with the reverse engineering of an alien spacecraft? Or is there more to this story that meets the eye? Now, here's where it gets thick, friends. It says, David Adair is an internationally recognized expert in space technology spinoff applications for industry and commercial use. At the age of 11, he built his first of hundreds of rockets, which he designed and tested. At age 17, he won the most outstanding in the field of engineering services award from the U.S. Air Force. Currently, David has his own research company, Intersect Incorporated. He continues to work and speak on advanced technology and sustainable energy for the whole planet. Um, this is where I have a problem, a uh, big problem. I, I happen to know, you know, you can talk to people that work in the space industry, especially now that we have all these private companies popping up and former astronauts are going to work for SpaceX or Virgin Atlantic or other uh, private space companies. And I invite you, uh, spend some time on the phone, call around, try to get to or email other let's call them recognized experts in the field of space technology and ask them if they ever heard of David Adair. I wasn't able to find one person that ever heard of him. However, if you ask UFO people if they've heard of David Adair, almost everyone has heard of David Adair in that strange subculture of the UFO world. Uh, so I find this claim to be extremely suspect, but we'll get into more of that. Uh, and again, with twice now, they they have to mention that he met Stephen Hawking, which I find suspect. Why do you have to mention that he met Stephen Hawking twice in a couple of paragraphs? But here we have it again. David told him he also got ideas through his dreams. Uh, yeah. Actually, they doubled up. They doubled it up. They wrote it twice. So, all right. So that's what we get from his so-called biography. He's an internationally recognized space expert. He gets his ideas from his dreams, just like Stephen Hawking. And uh, somehow he's met every famous science person that you've ever heard of uh, back in the day, you know. So uh, let's stop sharing this. Now, I found this interesting, too. David Adair was part of Dr. Stephen Greer's disclosure project. And, you know, uh, people that are still want to believe Stephen Greer has any real information, always point to his disclosure project and say, well, Stephen Greer did a lot of great work with that disclosure project, and he got all these witnesses and whistleblowers. Well, tonight we're going to hear from one of Stephen Greer's whistleblowers from the so-called disclosure project that he ran. And I want you all to tell me if this guy speaking and he was indeed verifiably uh, one of the witnesses in the disclosure project with Stephen Greer. I want you to listen to this guy speaking and tell me, does this make Stephen Greer's disclosure project look good or bad? I know what I believe. Um, and we have seen that Stephen Greer did very little vetting. I don't believe Stephen Greer vetted anything this guy said or checked or fact checked him on anything. If he did, there's no, you know, talk of that or record of that when he gives his so-called testimony about this alien engine. And for those unaware, essentially his story is that he was such a genius at the age of 17 that the United States government came and forcibly took him to Area 51. 
and they made him test flight his super advanced rocket engine, which, by the way, he can't show anybody or reproduce. But at 17, as a child, he was able to build this engine, but he can't somehow build it now as an adult and show us it. He claims that he has seven magnificent Incredible technological innovations and people are shoveling billions of dollars at him to develop these things. It gets thick, friends. And again, there's no verifiable facts or evidence that this guy can offer to prove his wild, fantastical stories. But uh, let's get into first. Uh, again, we have uh, we're citing fair use. Let's get into first what he says about uh, his disclosure project uh he discusses the disclosure project and uh you know how they contacted him and because uh you know i feel like if we listen to this first clip of him and this is some time ago and then we listen to the later clip we're going to go through which is more recent there's a lot of contradictions here uh so let's get into it friends this is david adair discusses the disclosure project and again i'm citing fair use Let me try that one more time. Okay, David Adair discusses the Disclosure Project. I hope I queued this past commercials. Let's get into it, friends. And uh, but one thing I want to point out that's very, very important is back here in the background is something that I recognized. This, my friends, is a box. Uh, which contains an Apollo space rocket model rocket. I recognize that box because I had one and probably still have one in my attic. Uh, what I used to do with rockets after building them and launching them a few times, I would put them back in the box and store them. And, and some days I would, you know, launch them again. But I think it's very interesting that a guy who claims that he is a rocket propulsion expert has boxes of children's toy model rockets in his, I guess this is his study. Yeah. The Disclosure Project contacted me. Um, a lady named Sherry Adamak uh, called me and wanted me to come and testify as to what I saw uh, at Area 51. And I didn't want to. I really had been off the grid. I just didn't want to deal with that because that is an area I'm really not involved in. Uh, people think, you know, I saw an alien engine and I built a, a fusion rocket, which actually is not a fusion rocket. It's a power plant. I just happened to be a rocket. I just and it's interesting that he says, that's an area I'm really not involved in. Um, but for some time, David Adair's full-time job was talking about his experiences at Area 51 and being a UFO whistleblower. If you're not really involved in that area, you're probably, it, it, that statement is not correct if you're making your full-time living talking about UFOs on Gaia TV and UFO conferences. Just happened to see an alien engine and that thing could have been dug up. So I, I'm not in the UFO community. I really don't even care about them, be truthful. Again, David Adair has made his living for some time now, speaking at UFO conferences, talking about UFO stuff, being in documentaries, talking about this Area 51 experience that he had. It's, it's disingenuous at best and dishonest at worst for him to say that he doesn't care about this stuff. He worked the whole conference circuit for many, many years talking about his story of witnessing what he believed was a techno organic alien engine in the basement of of some building in area 51. if they land here fine we all get to meet them but i'm not gonna spend my life running around looking up sky oh look at that you know no i'm a little bit busy with other things but uh that's why i, I I'm, you won't find me anymore at, at ufo communities um but she kept calling and kept calling and i was declining and then she said something that really got my attention she said Oh, well, we have about 120 hardware contact people coming out of Area 51. This is going to be a closed door meeting. If you don't come, you're going to miss out on all of that. What's hardware contact? Well, that's people who have seen and touched actually alien hardware. So here we have 
quite a tremendous claim, and uh, it's a secondhand account of Stephen Greer's one-time assistant. By the way, I think that's the same assistant that he claims was murdered by the CIA or the Men in Black for you know with fast-acting cancer because they were getting too close to the truth about aliens. Uh, claim, David Adair claims that they told him there'd be 120 people who had hands-on contact with alien technology at Area 51, and they would all be disclosing what they knew. So apparently we're supposed to just take his word for it that 120, I suppose, former employees or current employees of Area 51 all list, all risk their careers, their livelihoods, uh, breaking their security oath, getting prosecuted for the Espionage Act. Uh, or, you know, if you're really conspiratorial and you listen to some of these UFO people getting murdered for telling the truth about what they know about that alien technology in Area 51. And again, no proof is offered. We have no proof that this meeting ever took place, but he tells us that it did. I'm here to tell you, friends, that if a UFO huckster like Dr. Stephen Greer really had 120 people that had hands on uh, had their hands on alien technology at Area 51, we probably would have heard from more than just him. I find that suspicious. And she said they had people, dozens and dozens of people coming out of Area 51. And I was there. I knew there was a lot of people worked there. And I thought, oh, gosh, uh, I really wouldn't want to miss that party. Yeah. So apparently he agrees to come forth and tell his amazing story of witnessing an alien engine in the basement of some building in Area 51. And by the way, he never specifies the building. Uh, I've listened to him tell this story probably 10 times. He's he's never identified the building, which some people may not care about, but if you were really there, wouldn't you be able to describe the building or which building in, on Area 51 proper this alien engine was located in? All right, so we will, uh, we can knock that out, and now we'll get into a recent talk that he gave uh, last year, June of 2021. And this talk of his took place at the United Kingdom Awakening Expo. And I just want to say, if if this, you're going to, you're, maybe you'll agree with me when you hear what he talks about. If I had paid money to get into something called the Awakening Expo and heard what this guy had to say, I, I think I'd want my money back. Uh, you, honestly, UK Awakening, really, you kind of have to be asleep to believe this. This is dream time, friends. Story time. Um, let's get into it. So again, we're citing fair use. We are uh, discussing David Adair and his various claims of having witnessed aliens technology at Area 51 as a 17-year-old child. Um, and listen, it's important that we note here uh, that I have talked about it before. There's something very common with these so-called UFO insiders and grifters and hucksters. It's something I call UFO disease. For many, many years, David Adair ran around and told his original story of having been a child genius prodigy science expert and uh getting whisked away to area 51 by famous historical figures like and meeting uh curtis lemay the general of and uh head of the joint chiefs of staff at the time and uh also meeting pioneers of uh the american space program uh people like Werner von braun and others I, he, one thing you'll notice when you listen to him is that he name drops all the time and all of his stories are very self aggrandizing. I find that incredibly suspicious, especially because he offers no actual physical proof, no records, no photographs, no uh, corroborating witnesses to his story. But uh, it is what it is. Now, uh, let's get into it, friends. Uh, this is called David Adair. 12 sites on the moon where NASA told us not to go. Yeah, let me do that one more time. I always forget to check the audio, so let me uh, make sure we have the audio. And again, this is fair use. This is a transformative work. We're educating the public about David Adair and his 
uh, fantastical claims of having witnessed an alien uh, engine in, at Area 51. Let's get into it, friends. It's, um, and I really love British, British accents. Um, so it's really been thrill, thrilling talking to y'all, meeting so many different people. Um, yeah, that's uh, the story you just saw. Um, that's pretty much the way it happened. Um, the, uh, because of my work, I was vacuumed into another world where they wanted to see comparing technologies. And the engine that I built, an electromagnetic fusion containment engine, it was about- uh, Again, um, I just want to stop to comment every so often for the purposes of fair use and also for the purposes of our discussing his claims, electromagnetic fusion engine. Go ask any physicist or scientist what that is. And uh, you let me know what they say. It's about the size of about a meter long. Uh, but the thing that they had, uh, it was the size of an 18 wheel semi. So I was a little disappointed. I thought I was further ahead than they were. But after talking to them, working with them, it's clearly, it wasn't their machine. Interestingly, his story about this so-called alien engine that he has witnessed at Area 51 changes, has changed considerably over time. Here, we have him describing the engine as the size of an 18-wheeler. Uh, and I'm not sure if he means the tractor and trailer together or just the tractor of an 18-wheeler. But at various times, he has described it as the size of a school bus. I've also heard him describe it as the size of a Volkswagen van, which is considerably smaller than a school bus or an 18-wheeler. His story has not stayed consistent over time. Um there was technological identifications on it that just are not from our systems beyond our technology our reach um, on my engine i had about five miles of wiring and i had rivets and screws and weld lines and seams i constructed the thing here is another problem um, he mentions that his engine was uh, one meter in length. And it's also important to note that somehow David Adair claims that he de developed this fusion rocket engine on his own at 17 years old, or, or later he claims that he did have help from all kinds of famous people while he was 17, which I find to be, <laughs> I mean, you know, you know, when I was 17, famous scientists weren't coming and hanging out with me and helping me build my rockets. But according to David Adair, in his situation, they were. Uh, but did you notice he just said he had about five miles of wire in his engine? Um, I challenge anybody, no matter how thin the wire is, try to contain five miles of wire in one meter. Remember, he just got done saying that his engine was one meter long. Now he's saying that his engine had five miles of wire in it. I, I mean, you know, I'm no physics expert, but I, I'd love to see somebody go get five miles of even the thinnest wire possible and try to contain that in a one meter distance. This thing, the size of a semi, didn't have a single rivet, screw, bolt, nut, uh, no weld lines, no seams. It just looked like an eggplant. Like Interestingly, uh, David Adair repeats the same thing that many other people have said about alien technology, uh, that there's no rivets, there's no weld lines, it looks molded. Uh, this is famously what Bob Lazar said about the so-called alien spacecraft he claimed to work on at Area 51. Uh, some people take that as corroboration, not me. I take it as he's repeating things that he has heard other so-called UFO insiders say. But uh, your opinion may differ. Just crew, which I think it probably did. Um, it's a clear case of what we would refer to as organic, inorganic technology. Um, somebody that came very close to stylizing that style uh, was uh, this artist named H.R. Geiger, who did alien movies with Sigoni Weaver. Well, he called that technology organic technology, and that's 
pretty close to what I was looking at. Yeah, and isn't it convenient that there is an Earth artist that nailed exactly what this alien engine that he saw looked like? It looked like an H.R. Geiger painting. I've heard him described in other uh, talks that he has given. I'm not sure what to think about that. If we take him at his word, okay, uh, it looks like an H.R. Geiger painting or something out of the movie Alien Al or Alien series, uh, you know, with Sigourney Weaver. Um, but there's so much going on uh, in the world right now. Uh, stuff like this just seems to be brushed aside. Interestingly, uh, I got to I, I, I didn't finish my point earlier. So David Adair for five or seven or eight years ran around and told his original story at UFO conferences. And at some point, people began to tire of hearing him tell the same old story over and over and over again. And then I believe that David Adair started suffering from UFO disease. And right now we're going to hear brand new self-aggrandizing stories of him being an incredible genius and savior of earth who is in possession of literally earth changing technology that only he has he's got seven devices he says in this talk and more it gets a little thick here but this is brand new uh information that he's sharing with the public but it's really not it's 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 lurking in the background it's driving everything. Um, an update for y'all, you'll be the first to hear this. Uh, I had a group approach me from the Mideast and these guys are all one percenters. I've never seen such wealth in my life. Have you ever seen a 747 private jet? It's unbelievable. And these guys run around in them like they're Cessnas. Um, Anyway, they are wanting me to become the director of an entirely new space program. The budget I would have would be 75 times the size of NASA. Well, that's quite a statement. <clears throat> and who are these mysterious Middle Eastern men? He doesn't name them. Which country are they from? He doesn't name them, which again, I find highly suspicious. And if we are to just look up NASA's annual budget, uh, we can do some quick math to see what kind of figures that he's talking about. So he said that these people offered him uh, 75 times NASA's budget. Uh, and, you know, this is where things get thick, friends, because NASA's budget is $22.6 billion last year. If we times that by 75, uh, that means they offered him $1,695 billion. Six, is that right? I think that's right. I have a calculator right here. He was offered $1,695 billion as an annual operating budget to run a new space program. And apparently, uh, remember, this talk was recorded last year. So instead of taking people up on their offer of $1,695 billion to run a space program, David Adair is still working for Gaia TV and uh, working UFO conferences, giving his talks for a couple hundred dollars, last I checked. Uh, most recently, in the last several months, he's appeared somewhere. So... I would just ask my audience, if somebody offered you control of a budget of a program worth $1,695 billion, or, or you can go travel around to UFO conferences and tell UFO stories for a few hundred dollars a pop, what would you be doing right now if this offer was made sometime just previous to last year? Uh, the, you know... Uh, some people, many people have asked me to talk about him, evaluate his statements, research him. I mean, at some point, this stuff becomes, the statements being made are so stupid and ridiculous and childish and unlikely that I don't want to put work into this guy. I don't want to spend a week fact-checking him because 
it's very easy to see that he's full of shit. Somebody offered him that being the head of a $1,695 billion project. And instead of saying yes and doing that, he decided to go talk at UFO conferences for another few years. That makes absolutely no sense. And it is, I believe, proof positive that this guy is full of it. Can you imagine what I could do with that? No, you can't because you have no idea what I'm thinking. Uh, somebody asked me, uh, well, God, David, aren't you scared about this stuff? What? Enormous amounts of money? Um, <laughs> and if that's not enough for you to deal with, there's now, which has happened in the last three weeks, a second group of one percenters have showed up and they're competing with each other. Wow, isn't that interesting that this man, David Adair, that no one in the space program uh, or who works in the space industry or aerospace industry, and by the way, I know some people, I've reached out to a bunch of them and asked all of them if they've ever heard of David Adair, Mr. Rocket Man. Nobody has ever heard of this guy outside of UFO circles. And he has just stated that uh, a group of Saudi investors, or I'm sorry, it wasn't Saudi, it was Middle Eastern investors, that he won't identify the country of origin, offered him a $1,695 billion budget to do his space things, right? To run a space program. And then he's so important that a whole nother group of super wealthy 1% individuals got involved and they started a bidding war to get him to run the space program for them. This man who uh, claims to be a rocket expert, a uh, propulsion expert, a energy and physics expert and more that no one ever heard of is so important. There is a bidding war. Now the first bidders offered him $1,695 billion to run their space program. Let's see what the second group of wealthy investors offered this very important genius, right? And now, you know, there, when I leave here on Sunday, I get home and four days after I'm home, their jet, their 747 will come and pick me up and they're taking me to their host country. I can't tell you which country this is. It's in Indonesia and the Pacific Rim is all I can tell you. Yeah, and interestingly, David Adair has a Facebook page and I, I don't know about you, but if a uh, you know super wealthy group of individuals was gonna pick me up in a 747 private jet, I might take some pictures of uh, you know me on the airplane or me meeting them at the airport or something and put on my Facebook, you won't find any evidence of him being whisked away by super wealthy people with a private 747 jet. By the way, go look up what the operating expenses to fly from here to Indonesia is for a 747 jet. That figure alone makes these claims of his pretty laughable. But they're offering three trillion and I'm going, oh, are you serious? Oh, okay. So, so the the second group of super wealthy individuals thinks that this guy is such a genius and so smart and so important that they're not going to offer him sixteen hundred and ninety five billion. They're going to offer him three trillion. Now that's a better deal. And according to him, just three weeks after he gave this talk, he was flying over there to talk to them about this three trillion dollar deal. But somehow, recently, he's still trying to work UFO conferences for a few hundred dollars a talk. Again, friends, if somebody offered you control of a $3 trillion budget to uh, work on your, I don't know, space projects, uh, wouldn't you do that instead of grifting and, you know, uh, running around to different UFO conferences for a couple hundred dollars? The fact that this man with a straight face says that first I got offered sixteen hundred ninety five billion, then I got offered three trillion dollars. But I didn't take either deal. I didn't take either deal. No, I decided it would be best in my financial best interest to just be one of the low ranking 
B or C celebrities at a UFO conference for a few hundred dollars to talk. And then I started remembering some things. Do you remember World War II? All the gold that the Nazis had, they raped all of Europe and about one half of the planet. And they took all that gold one place. And where did that gold end up at? We all believe in Indonesia. So if that's the case, I'm looking at about half of this stuff. Well, they're flying me down there because they, they asked me, do you want to see the wealth? Yes. Do you believe us? No. I mean, well, come on. You're going to hand like a trillion dollars, three trillion, they meant three. You're like, okay, you're going to hand three trillion to somebody you don't even know that well? Well, we know of you. None of this. Is yeah. Uh, so even though nobody in the actual aerospace industry has ever heard of David Adair, somehow super wealthy people from Indonesia with Nazi gold, you got you to gotta add in Nazis if you're going to tell a good UFO story. They all do it. You add in some Nazi stuff. Right. So apparently these people in Indonesia got three trillion dollars and they're going to give it to this guy to develop a space program. And where did they get the money from Nazi gold? I've never heard that all the Nazi gold that they pilfered went to Indonesia. But OK, I've heard it went to Argentina. But uh, OK, David Dare says it went to Indonesia. And they're going to use that Nazi gold to give him three trillion dollars to work on a space program. This is making sense, y'all. Um unless there's something else I've, I've always suspected this because in my life i've been in proximity of a lot of one percenters and they don't they don't think like we do they're just they might as well be aliens as far as i know because they don't have well they can walk out of this oh, sorry friends let's uh let's cue past that and of course, this is a monetized video. Uh, so somebody is making money off of this level of garbage. Uh, it, it's inconceivable to me, but this is the world that we live in. Like the way you and I are, we have to pay our electric bill, you know, and our car payments and stuff. These people don't have such thoughts, but, um, I think there is a civil war going on between the one percenters on this planet. I think that's what you all are feeling. You all feel things? Yeah, I hear it. I was over at Contact in the Desert and asked that got a resounding yes. You can feel something happening. I think there's a, a civil war going on with them. One half of them is wanting to keep all the money for themselves. The other half is wanting to release the money back into the world so you could build the infrastructure back up and have a world to live in. Because if you don't, you're not gonna have a world pretty soon. Um, there's so many things going on uh, in that area. So if that is true, that could be what is driving all of this. And, yeah, and it's interesting that some people still choose to believe him, even with this, you know, and, and hey, I welcome all opinions here. Uh, Tic-Tac-Toe says, no one in air, airspace knows him. Yes, they do. He's well known. It's a squeaky voice that has no proof. Uh, I wasn't able to find any proof of any aerospace employee, insider, engineer, scientist, physicist. Uh, I wasn't able to find anybody in the aerospace or space industry that had ever heard of him. And I did reach out to the people that I could. I emailed a bunch of people asking if anybody had ever heard of him. And what I got back was a resounding no. If you, Tic-Tac-Toe, know anybody that I can go and verify actually works in the aerospace or space industry that has heard of him, email me at Truth Seeker Show. I'd love to talk to that person. Um, so we do welcome all opinions, but, you know, uh, I, I, I can't. There's not much that I can do here with this guy. Uh, he claims that he is well known in that industry. All I can do is reach out to people and ask people if they'd ever heard of him. And that's what I've done. If you can prove me wrong, I'd love to hear about it. And they're right about one thing, though. Um, their downside risks on this is not bad. Um, 
the, I have seven different projects. It's taken me 45 years to build all seven of them. They're ready to go to be implemented. Why I built them? Because I just couldn't stop, you know, it's just- And uh, Tic-Tac-Toe or anybody else who believes this man is uh, the genuine real deal here. Um, one of the other things that I did is I did a uh, United States patent search. I wasn't able to find any patents under his company name, his purported company name, uh, or under his name. And I suppose I would ask my everyone within the sound of my voice, if you have developed a revolutionary fusion rocket engine, even if you just developed fusion, uh, wouldn't you file some patents to protect your intellectual property? Apparently, David Adair has no patents, though he claims to be some kind of aerospace genius who's invented many, many things. Uh, he makes a lot of ridiculous claims, uh, like we're about to witness him claiming that he has perfected the thorium nuclear generator, um, but he has no patents. He claims that he invented a fusion-powered rocket engine that could take us to nearby star systems easily. But he has no patents. I find that extremely problematic. Uh, after all, if you have indeed invented incredible world-changing technology, why would you not patent it? Like an artist, you know how they paint they don't paint one painting, do they? They fill a whole room big as this, full of paintings. Why do they keep on painting? It's because they're just driven to do so. So I was driven on these projects. They're all completed now, and all they need is just large amounts of money. However... Isn't that convenient? All his projects are done, but now he needs a lot of money from investors. But apparently he didn't take up those first two groups of people. The first group of people offered him $1,695 billion to develop his, you know, technology. And the second group of people offered him $3 trillion to develop his technology. But here he's saying he needs money. And apparently did not take either of those investment groups up on their offer of first $1,695 billion and later $3 trillion. Sure. One of the projects, um, that caught their attention most. There was two of them, two of the seven. Uh, anybody in here ever heard of a thorium reactor? Yes, yes, okay. Well, why don't we have thorium reactors? Well, it's a little story back in the 50s. United States, Soviet Union, pretty much, and then China, they were, you know, wanting to blow each other away with nuclear weapons. So they had to build a lot of nuclear weapons. Well, you need nuclear fuel to detonate a nuclear warhead. So what would give you nuclear fuel? Fission and fusion reactions of nuclear power. That was over here. Over here is thorium reactors and the other cut, the good twin of fission and fusion you have not met called fusion containment. So these two were sitting there but you can't make nuclear warhead fuel with these two. For once, I agree with, with these two. That's true. So they shelved these and forgot about them, and they went with fusion and fission reaction because you can make fuel for nuclear warheads. Isn't that just brilliant? So they went down that road, and over the course of time, three things have happened which should have never happened. The three things were Three Mile Isle in Pennsylvania in the United States, uh, Chernobyl in Russia, and Fukushima in Japan. None of those would have happened if they went with these reactors over here. That's a fact. No one it's interesting also to note that uh, while there are a few actual thorium nuclear reactors in the world, uh, they are all funded uh, near as I could tell by government to the tune of billions of dollars. But Mr. Adair here, uh, without benefit of billions of dollars, is claiming that, is about to claim here that he has perfected the thorium generator. 
uh, nuclear power generator, but of course, or nuclear reactor, but of course, again, uh, he has no patents. One will argue that. So they've been bit in the butt three times by these things. And now they're, they're being pushed and driven to go to an alternate nuclear system. Well, I have pretty much perfected the thorium reactor. All I need is to start manufacturing, get a facility and go. Um, yeah, uh, and by the way, look at the size of an average nuclear reactor. There is no evidence that I found that a thorium nuclear reactor would be any smaller than a, uh, you know, traditional, let's call it a traditional nuclear uh, energy facility. But he's going to just manufacture his somehow in a factory. It's as if he's claiming that his is a tabletop or something. Uh, I, I don't understand. You can't just, you, you have to build a nuclear reactor on site. They're huge. You, you don't just manufacture a nuclear facility uh, or generator reactor in a factory. But again, this man claims he's some kind of genius. I'm sorry, but a genius or somebody who was actually well read on nuclear technology would know that. A billionaire in Texas just as recent as six weeks ago approached me wanting to build thorium reactors. I said, yeah, you definitely got the money. And I looked at his funds and verified him. Yeah, he, he could write me a check for a half billion dollars. And I went, okay. All right. And, and it's also interesting to note that we're just 10 minutes into his talk. And so far, we have an anonymous group of Middle Eastern investors that offered him $1,695 billion. We have an anonymous group of Asian investors that offered him $3 trillion. And now we have a Texas billionaire who offered him a billion dollars to uh, work on some of his science projects. Let's see what happens after that offer. That would get us uh, some thorium reactors. And I said, have you ever done this before? He went, no. I went, okay. Have you got friends in Washington? Oh yeah, I got good friends. Well, we'll see how good they are because you're gonna have the other shoe drop any minute. So he takes off. I don't see him for a couple of days. He calls back. Sounds flat as the board, he's all depressed. And I said, let me guess, they're not gonna give you any license or any clearances. Yeah, that's the other shoe, dude. Uh, you're about to upset the Fusion Fission apple cart. And uh, but, <laughs> so that was into that. However, he started me thinking down this line more than I was expecting to. Yeah, and isn't it interesting that David Adair could have had a billion dollar budget, but the government is suppressing this advanced technology. Listen, with the with the energy shortages that are taking place, especially on the West Coast and the brownouts and the blackouts and rolling blackouts, if the government was able to harness uh, this new technology, they wouldn't stop it, friends. That's my opinion. I'm entitled to it. But according to David Adair, he could have developed his thorium nuclear generators, reactors, but the government, you know, they're suppressing the technology. That's why he can't save the United States' energy infrastructure with his amazing invention that he never patented. So I assembled some key personnel that I have, and we found the, the, where the problem is with thorium reactor at this moment. We have a solution for it. So I just called him back and I said, you know, I want to tell you one thing about the thorium reactors. Uh, I've got an offer in the Middle East. They'll give me a facility, the money. I need no licenses. I don't need any permits. I just go build. You know, it's kind of like blazing saddles. Badges? We don't need no stinking badges. You know, so I just <clears throat> going to go on and build the reactors. Now this is also a ridiculous statement because there are international treaties surrounding uh, the use of nuclear materials. You can't just go build whatever you want with nuclear, you know, material. Uh, but again, uh, this is the, the wacky world of David Adair. This isn't reality, in my opinion. So reality and, you know, things like international treaties don't matter.
he just he's just saying things like he's just going to go build thorium nuclear reactors with no permits and okay now since the funding's coming from somebody else you can come along with me as a junior partner and you're not going to be running anything but i'll share with you because you actually really pushed this idea into me and i didn't want to cut you out completely well he didn't want to participate so all the thorium reactors are mine now so yeah. David Adair is so important that he's turning down billion dollar development deals for this technology he claims that he is is in possession of uh, you know <laughs> I mean it just gets so thick it's ridiculous so he turns down 1695 billion dollars then he turns down three trillion dollars to run a space program uh, and now he's turning down a billion dollars from the Texas billionaire and he's going to keep this technology for himself. Sure he is. And again, this talk was uh, over a year ago. I haven't heard anything about his amazing thorium nuclear reactors in the news. Have you? It's probably because they don't exist and neither does this groundbreaking technology and solution that he's talking about. And again, if he did have some solution for this, it would be worth billions of dollars to the energy industry. Uh, and he hasn't patented anything. What I'll do, what I'll do is I'm, I've got to go see this other one percenter group, see what they're offering. And finally, I just talked to both groups and told them, I'm like an NFL player. I'm a free agent. I'll take whoever offers the most and drops the money first. And I really. Ah, here we go again. Sure he will. Sure. He's going to, uh, he's going to get himself billion dollar technology deals while he's right now working at UFO conferences for pennies. Cause that makes sense. You know, why, why would you take billion dollar deals or trillion dollar deals when you can work at UFO conferences for pennies telling stories? I'm not doing this for me. I have retired when I was 49. I've got more money than God. I, I will never live long enough to spend it all. Well, that's a bold statement too, which would make him a billionaire. So he's also a billionaire. I mean, if you're saying you have more money than God, you're not just a millionaire, right? You gotta be a billionaire, right? On par with Elon Musk. But we've never heard about billionaire David Adair super rich David Adair. This this makes no sense, friends. And I don't need to be doing this. I'm 65 years old. I should go fishing with my wife, who's a hell of a fisher. So anyway, instead, I'm pulling a Colonel Sanders. Colonel Sanders was 70 years old when he started KFC. So now it looks like I'm going to do the same thing, except it's in space. Um, <laughs> he's going to be the Colonel Sanders of space friends. And why would you take three trillion? Why would you, why would you take a $3 trillion deal to run a space program when you could just go fishing with your wife? Who's a hell of a fisher. Do this, which I'm pretty sure I'm going to, it is for you, all of you, every country on the planet. You know, he's going to save Earth with his groundbreaking technology that he never bothered to patent. I will, I'll crawl out my semi retirement and go to work. But man, if I run this program, it's going to be a program like you have never seen. You think you've seen a space program? You've seen nothing but squat. Wait till you see what, get a load of what I'm going to do. Somebody, a friend of mine, asked me, well, what are you going to do the first hour of the first day? Well, I'm going to have the president of my host country call the current residing CEO of Rockwell International, and I'm going to tell them I would like to place an order for six new orbiters. Don't they think that's going to get their attention? Especially, it's really not that much money. It's only six. Rockwell International, by the way, is responsible for the space show. So he's claiming that he's going to take investors money and he is going to 
order six space shuttles, even though no one has built Rockwell has not built a new space shuttle since the 80s, right? But somehow they're going to pull out a 40 year old technology, which this again doesn't make any sense. Friends, if you were in possession of a fusion rocket engine that was, you know, akin to alien technology, it was so advanced. Why would you use 40 year old rocket technology or space shuttle technology? Why do, wouldn't you design a, a new spacecraft with your revolutionary engine? Uh, none of this makes any sense uh, because it, once you apply logic to this man, just very simple logic, his whole story, I believe, falls apart here. I mean, none of this makes any sense. This guy's turning down trillion dollar deals. $1,695 billion deals, a billion dollar deal. But now he's getting investors and he's going to run this space program and he's going to contact a company that hasn't made a space shuttle in 40 years and order six of them. Uh, I'm sorry to tell, tell everybody this, but that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. $36 billion. Um, yeah. so I'm He's going to spend $36 billion on uh, a 40-year-old spacecraft design making six of them sure getting a, an orbiter for six billion a piece damn that's a that's some kind of solar special so um uh, i will order the new fleet and these are not like the shuttles you saw of nasa um on every orbiter there are thirty thousand two hundred thermal tiles and no two are alike and we glue them onto the shuttle no my new shuttles will have a thermal blanket. The thermal blankets were perfected over the two hump where the shuttle engines are. Remember the two round humps by the big tall fin and there's a hump on each side? Well, look at the way the surface of it. That's a thermal blanket. I'll put that over the entire shuttle. No more thermal tile problems. Yeah, uh, this is again, someone who has a rudimentary knowledge of actual spacecraft. Uh, these thermal blankets uh, were never applied to a space shuttle. They always just had thermal tiles. But, you know, he's such a genius that he's going to just, you know, retrofit them, I guess. Which caused Challenger and Columbia to, to burn up. And neither one of them should have happened. It wasn't a technical failure. It was a management failure. That's another thing. You have never seen any leadership in any type of space program on this planet. And you've seen very little leadership in any of the damn countries with the governments. And again, this is a ridiculous, stupid statement. Uh, I, yeah, I have my problems with current day NASA. Um, and that began about the time that they retired the space shuttle program, but didn't have a replacement for a launch vehicle. I thought that was very incompetent on their on the part of their leadership. I thought that was uh, a, a huge mistake. We had to rely on Russians, uh, Russian space, you know, rockets to get our astronauts to and from the International Space Station. And now we're relying on private companies. At, NASA has no orbiter. So but to say there's been no leadership in NASA or any other space industry or, you know, space program in the world is kind of stupid. Um, one can point to the Apollo program. There had to be incredible leadership to get that Apollo program to the moon and back so many times. Uh, but according to David Adair, there's been no good leadership in any space program on Earth ever. This is a nonsensical statement. In my world, it's going to be a different world, y'all. I'm going to look like Dr. No from James Bond down there with my own island. So I'm not, you know... Back to that guy, I don't need no stinking badges. I'll just go on and build the stuff. If I got that kind of funding, I'll just go straight on into anything. While the six orbiters are being built, um, I will uh, have an island down there that I will be converting into a launch port. And then I'll start construction <laughs> of... He's so important and he's going to have funding so massive that he's just going to buy himself his own private island that he can build a spaceport on okay the wagon wheel space station not that miserable erector set you got up there called the iss i mean there's certain parts of the iss you could take your hand 
and crush it. It's just aluminum foil. What a mess. Um, yeah, and again, this man is such a genius, and he's going to do everything better than NASA ever did it. Or he's going to build a better space, space station than the International Space Station, which was funded to the tune of billions of dollars by different countries all over the world. All over the world, different countries, China, the United States, Russia, and other countries, India, other many, many countries participated in the International Space Station program. And they pooled their resources, all the best engineers from all these different countries designed parts of that space station. But David Adair, a guy that no one in the aerospace industry ever heard of, who has no patents, who's claiming that he's turning down billion dollar deals all the time, he's going to build us a better space station. Sure he is. Wait till you get a load of my space, Will. Yeah, yeah. go ahead and try to squeeze that thing. So... There's multiple programs that thorium reactors will be underway because one of the very first things that my new orbiters will take out is a whole load of thorium reactors. No one's ever launched a reactor into orbit. They're afraid, oh, it might blow up and kill everybody. No, that's ridiculous. That's another nonsensical statement that anybody familiar with the space uh, with the real space programs of Earth would know is a nonsensical false statement. There have been nuclear reactors on spacecraft uh, that have already been launched, including the Voyager and others. How do you think that thing is powered? They're powered with a tiny nuclear reactor that will last and power that craft for, I believe, uh, in my talks with Stanton Freeman, he told me that those tiny nuclear reactors they put on some deep space exploration craft would power it for hundreds of years. So right here, you know, he's claiming to be some kind of expert on uh, the space industry. He doesn't know basic history of, of NASA and what they have launched and what they haven't. He's claiming that they've never launched a nuclear reactor. Go look it up. That's a completely and totally false statement. And anybody that was an expert on space and the space industry would know this. I'm no expert. I just happen to be uh, uh, kind of maybe what he was, which was a model rocket nerd who was interested in the history of space exploration and read a lot as a child. I can send a thorium reactor up and the fuel cells be separate from the device. Even if everything blew up, all you got is enriched salt coming back to the ground. Duh. So it's not a risk. <laughs> but when I get them up in orbit and assemble them together, I got a full-blown nuclear reactor. Do you know what that means in operational capacity? That'd be like going from batteries in a light to plugging it into the wall. You'd have so much power to work with up there. Um, I think I'm kind of deviating from what... From, that's the way my brain works, y'all. I mean, you know, my wife looks at me at times, she goes, sometimes I don't even know who you are anymore. Well, just ask them in whatever name I come up with, that's who you talk to. So um, I have so many thoughts rushing all the time. Um, but back in Area 51, the, the experiences I've had, that was, do you remember the thorium reactor? Do you remember me mentioning something about a fusion containment? Reactor? Well, brother, wait till you meet this thing. Um, that's what I built. In 1970, June 20th, 1971, I launched a rocket out of White Sands, New Mexico, Proving Grounds. And it was called Proving Grounds back in those days. And that rocket wasn't, there's only two types of rocket engines in the world today. Solid fuel, liquid fuel. This rocket was neither one. It was something else. Um, that's also incorrect. Uh, again, anybody familiar with space history would know that there's nuclear rocket engines. There's much, you know, there has been experimental rocket engines that were uh, also hybrids of both solid and liquid fueled. These, he, he's making a lot of nonsensical statements that anybody familiar with the actual history of space exploration would know are false statements, but okay. It was a fusion containment engine. Well, what's so great about that? 
Well, I created a magnetic bottle, and inside that magnetic bottle, I detonated an H-bomb and contained it. Well, what good would that be? The power of a sun at your fingertips for an engine. Um, yeah, and again, this man claims he's 65 years old last year. So he's 66 years old. He's cl claiming that he created this revolutionary rocket engine at 17 years old, and then the government came to him. He's claiming that he shot off or tested one of his revolutionary engines at White Sands Proving Grounds. Um, last I checked, they don't let 17-year-old kids shoot off model rockets, but okay. It, it just this The whole story is too unbelievable if you just stop for a moment and think about, you know, what he's saying here and and take it a step further it's not even a rocket engine i'm building i'm building a power plant a new type of power plant that you've never seen yeah and and here's another point of problem for his story any person that starts building a nuclear device the the government and the atomic energy commission would certainly investigate and probably shut down you can't just build nuclear devices in your garage, too. The machining required for that is incredibly, incredibly precise. But he has an explanation for that, which is that he was such a genius that he got the help of Lawrence Livermore Labs and all these other high-tech facilities that helped him build his engine. So he was such a genius at age 17 that the government and all kinds of government labs helped him build this revolutionary rocket engine. Uh, which begs the question, if he created this revolutionary rocket engine that was, you know, so revolutionary, why are we still using, you know, 100-year-old rocket engine technology to get to low Earth orbit? Wouldn't we use his super advanced rocket engine that he invented, I don't know, 40 or 50 years ago and the government was involved in its invention? And it had the ability to do extraordinary things uh in phase one this nuclear power plant could take a piece of fuel no bigger than my thumb and run all the power needs of europe for a year now i haven't done the math on this but uh again that's an incredibly fantastical statement at 17 years old He's claiming that he built a some sort of nuclear device. He's claiming it's a fusion generator, which again would be that kind of technology would be worth billions of dollars in, in private industry and in military. It would be worth billions or trillions of dollars, but he never patented this so-called revolutionary technology of his. Yeah, that's a fact. And people, is he talking about coal fusion? Oh, no, this thing is anything but cold. In the center of my engine, it runs at 100 million degrees centigrade, 10,000 times harder than the core of the sun. Yeah, this is a problem as well. Um, if you had a temperature, this is again where he makes amateur hour mistakes. Did you hear him? He just said that the center of his engine runs at 10,000 times the temperature of the core of the sun then i i would want to know what are you containing that incredibly ridiculous high temperature with it would melt through any earth material in moments in moments right but i guess he does have an explanation for that it was magnetically contained i don't know how and another interesting point is that this man claims to have built this revolutionary device at 17 years old. In this video, he's now 65 years old, which would mean that he's, uh, what, you know, 40, 50 years smarter, 40, 50 years of, of better materials are available. Couldn't he show us a working version? He never has, friends. He's never shown a working version of any of his fantastical devices that he claims to have invented. I find that incredibly suspect, or also known as, this guy's a bullshitter. Well, what contains that kind of fury? Here we go. Magnetic fields. The magnetic fields I built. 
to put in terms you could easily grab hold of, they're about like artificial black holes. What does a black <laughs> hole do out in space? This is where it gets incredible. Listen, go do the math. Go talk to a physics person. How much energy would you need to create a mini black hole, right? And how much energy would you need to create a magnetic field that would be strong enough to contain a temperature of something that is 10,000 times the core, the temperature of the core of the sun. The math is absolutely ridiculous. If you try it, if there's any math experts out there, I'd love to see what amount of energy you would need to do this. But again, I believe this is some amateur hour mistake and he hasn't thought through basic level physics uh, to, you know, come to the realization that his story is absolutely science fiction, nonsensical garbage. Space that we have proven. They go by a sun and what do they do? They swallow it. What is a sun? Hundreds of millions of hydrogen bombs going off continuously, simultaneously. And yet a black hole pulls up, sucks it in. Not even x-rays can escape and sucks it in and gone. Obviously, black holes don't have a problem containing suns. So that's what my magnetic bottle is comprised of. <laughs> He's got a magnetic bottle, friends. He's got a magnetic bottle that contains a fusion power generator that the temperature of which is 10,000 times the core of the sun and his magnetic bottle. Remember, this is all in the size of one meter and it includes five miles of wire and... It includes a mini black hole generator, all in the size of one meter. It's getting a little thick in here, friends. Um, I learned all of this from dreams. And then when they took me to Area 51, I had built an exact duplicate of what they had in their basement. Mine was a lot smaller. And honestly, to be fair, I had a Model A, and they had a Lamborghini. But their Lamborghini was busted and it wouldn't run. So um, that's why they brought me there, Terry 51. Because how did this 17-year-old kid replicate that engine down there in the basement of Area 51 without any help other than my own as far as <laughs> conception? Now, in actual yeah, what are the odds, man? The government is in possession of a school bus size alien engine, and he created a one meter model of the same exact alien himself. And then the government somehow realized that this 17 year old child had an exact duplicate of that technology that he created in his basement or his garage. And they brought them to Area 51 to fix their broken one. Okay. Building of the thing, buddy, I had help like you wouldn't believe. And here's where it gets really thick. Because now he's going to make a lot of ridiculous, fantastical claims. Um, a man entered my life. Anybody ever heard of somebody named Curtis LeMay? General Curtis LeMay? Four-star general. Chief of the Joint Chiefs of the United States military. He also is the designer of the B-52 Strata Fortress, which here's how my brain just jumped to something else. How do you clear an Iraqi bingo parlor? B-52. Bad joke, y'all. Terrible joke. <laughs> well, especially for all those innocent people that our United States government has slaughtered in the you know, uh, pursuit of democracy somehow. You know, I want to get away from warfare on this planet so bad. And with this systems I'm talking about, I think I can pull us out of this mess we're in. Um, but anyway, the he was the designer of the B-52, founder of Strategic Air Command. He was a general standing next to John Kennedy in the 1964 Cuban Missile Crisis. Okay? Pretty powerful man. Well, Yes, and David Adair... A man with no patents, no formal education in science, uh, no known published papers on physics, 
space exploration, rocket design, or anything else was so important that a four-star general sought out the help of a 17-year-old child. Well, he met me through my mother, which is, it's long detail stories that it calls all this stuff to work. But anyway, with those details it lies the credibility. So my mother became friends with him. I met him and we got together and he funded the entire project of building that rocket you just saw in this program. That's how it came to be. I wasn't by myself. No, I had an army of Air Force engineers. <laughs> yes, because <clears throat> the army always offers the United States government always offers a 17 year old child, an army of engineers, all of our best laboratory uh, and and people to help him develop technology that nobody ever heard of. That just so happens to be exact to alien technology that the government is somehow in possession of. Sounds plausible, right? No, friends, this is so ridiculous. National Lawrence Livermore Laboratories, uh, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. I had um, ran and Battelle Memorial. I'm Kelly Beezer. Ah, hold on one second. Someday I'm going to start posting these videos elsewhere so that I don't have to deal with that. I apologize for that. Again, we're citing fair use. We're educating the public about uh, the scientific claims of one David Adair, a so-called UFO insider, Area 51 insider. I had a legion of the military industrial complex to help me build that thing. The reason why they wanted my rocket to become a first strike nuclear weapon. <laughs> Can you believe that? This engine I'm building in phase four, I can show you on a board how it can get you faster, millions of times the speed of light without breaking the speed of light and remaining constant in Newtonian physics. And Again, uh, this man doesn't even have a rudimentary uh, high school level knowledge of actual physics. Did you hear what he just said? His fusion powered magnetic contained uh, rocket engine can reach millions of times the speed of light without breaking the speed of light. None of this makes any sense. This is, this is like, it sounds to me like those guys who write the Star Trek or Star Wars techno babble to make the so-called science sound reasonable or like it works. So again, uh, let's continue just a little bit further, and then we got to we got to we're only twenty three minutes in. I, I I lost track of the absolutely fantastical, ridiculous, stupid, childish claims of this man in twenty three minutes and thirty eight seconds. You now, then they want to take that marvelous situation and turn it into a first strike nuclear weapon. <laughs> man, what is wrong with this planet? So. I will come out, you know, I won't go in retirement. If they drop the money, I'll start the mechanisms. I'll start building everything. You will see me and hear me till you're probably sick of me on every news channel on the planet because it's just going to be too big of stories to ignore, especially when I'm roaring into space with nuclear power plants, <laughs> you know, space wheels, space factories. Wait till you get a load of my space hospital. Oh, he's building a space hospital. There's too. so much stuff in, in here. There was experiments I ran and I work in all, I work in about 14 different disciplines, electronics, metals, computers, pharmaceuticals, bioengineering. I work in all these areas. And it's interesting that this man claims that he has worked in all of these different scientific areas, but he does not have a single scientific paper published in any peer-reviewed scientific journal. He's such a genius. He's such an industry pioneer. 
He's working in all of these different scientific areas, but he doesn't have a single patent. He doesn't have a single published paper in a peer-reviewed scientific journal. Uh, he doesn't have a single prototype of a working device that he can show anyone. Uh, but he is some kind of a genius that is, uh, you know, revolutionizing technology on planet Earth. Uh, you know, I find this extremely problematic at, at best. Um, something happened in space in one of my projects that told us where we want to go. How many people in here ever heard of a thing called Skylab? Big thing, as big as this entire room it was in 1974 and 75. We put it out there with a giant operating orbital laboratory. Some interesting things happened in that laboratory, y'all. When we got the first crew up there, that crew, none of them are pilots. They're all medical doctors. You know, good doctors, lousy pilots though, they get in there, they're not even there a half hour. One astronaut push off from this end of the wall, goes flying to the other end, hey look, I'm Superman. And he forgot about inertia, momentum, and we smack into the wall called kinetic energy. So a lousy physicist, good doctor though, hits the wall down there and fillets his arm to the bone in orbit. So they call down to Capcom and I'm looking at Capcom over here. He's about as white as snow. <laughs> and he said, uh, I know it costs $2 billion to get us up here. We've only been here 30 minutes. We'd like to stitch him up and go on with the mission. Capcom stand there said, yeah, go on with the mission. So they put stitches in his arm. And then 97 hours to the number, 97, they call back and they said, um, Houston, we need a secured channel and we need all the medical people on staff ASAP. Yeah, and again, he's smarter than everyone at NASA, including when it comes to medicine, apparently, or being, you know, medical emergencies. And Capcom looked at me, I looked at him, and he said, God, they've killed somebody up there now. So they come on, the doctor said, I don't know how to tell you this, just look. They pull the bandage back off the astronaut's arm. Here's all the stitches stuck on the bandage. He doesn't even have a scar. He's completely healed, 96 hours. What happened? 23 things changed. What's that number, y'all? Chromosomes. When you unchain the 23 chromosomes from the field of gravity, the first thing they do, they grab the white corpuscles. They have antibacterial defense system in your bloodstream, turns them into super white corpuscles. Then the cellular generation, the genes pick up and they jump into warp drive. You will heal so fast up there, it's unbelievable. So on my space hospital, you put a badly burned victim, 90% of their bodies burned in second, third degree. They put them on a medical shuttle. The medical shuttle takes them up. They wake up and the first thing they notice, no pain without any drugs. Why? There's no gravity up there causing the blood to be pulled to the epidermis level. You ever burn your finger with a match and feel your heart beat in it? That won't happen up there. And then the cellular regeneration starts. You feed them- This is again nonsensical, but okay. Cause the body is moving so fast he or she would heal so fast they would not have any scar tissue. That's just one experiment of 16,000 experiments I have for the space hospital. <laughs> All right. I, you know, look, I, 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 I'm trying my best, but I, it's getting so deep in here that I don't think that I can continue listening to this nonsense any longer. Uh, he's got six. So let's let's just do a recap here. We'll do a recap of of some of his claims. All right. Uh, not mentioned here, but he uh, also at various times has claimed that he interacted with and was taught by early rocket pioneers like Werner von Braun uh, at Area Fifty One, 
Werner von Braun came to look at his engine and uh, various, again, th this guy claims that he's so important. All these important historical figures have interacted with him and, and helped him in his development of this incredible world changing technology that nobody's allowed to see. He has world changing technology that nobody's allowed to see. He has world-changing technology that somebody offered him. Let's see. First, somebody offered him $1,695 billion to develop, and he didn't take them up on their offer. Then, so that's our first anonymous source that he's using. Nobody's allowed to talk to these people, only him. He doesn't name names. No researcher can go verify those claims. Then... Another mysterious group of anonymous individuals that no researcher or interested party is allowed to interview or talk to offered him three trillion dollars to develop this world changing technology. And he turned them down. Then a Texas billionaire offered him a billion dollars to develop his so-called thorium nuclear reactor because he had he cracked the code, friends. He had the solution to the thorium generator problem. Again, he has no patents, but he turned down that billion dollars. And now he's claiming that he is going to run a space program and purchase six space shuttles from a company that hasn't made space shuttles in 40 years. Then he's going to retrofit them with better thermal technology. But somehow, even though he has a, an engine that can go 100 times the speed of light, He's just going to let them use regular old 50 or 100 year old rocket technology. Next, we get this ridiculous claim that he has some kind of medical technology that can heal people super fast in space. But NASA's never experimented with that. NASA doesn't have that technology. He does. Now he's claiming that he has 16,000 experiments. He also claimed that he has seven incredible devices that he it's taken him 45 years to develop. But again, nobody ever sees a single device from him. Nobody ever sees any of his so-called incredible technology. Now, I have talked to a friend uh, who asked him to see the technology, and David Adair made a ridiculous amount of excuses, you know, talking about NDAs and all these other things, why he can't show him working prototypes of any of his so-called advanced technology. But being... Uh, when I was growing up, I was a rocket nerd. I, I Someday I'm going to pull them out and I'll show you. I have uh, some of this crap still here. Not crap, but, uh, you know, old experiments that I built. And uh, I learned to make my own rocket engines out of stump remover and sugar. Look it up. It's called Rocket Candy. You can look it up on YouTube. Uh, I'm not responsible for anybody that decides to experiment. It's dangerous with that stuff. But as a child growing up, I built bigger and bigger and bigger rockets. And eventually the little mile rocket engines that you could get at the toy store or the hobby store weren't big enough to propel some of these huge, you know, six foot tall rockets that I was building. So I learned to make uh, my own rocket engines that were illegal. To be very honest with you, I made rocket engines that were way too big. You can only go so big with a rocket engine as a model rocket before the FAA and everybody else says you can't just shoot that off, you know? And now there are ways around that. You could get experimental, you know, you can get some kind of license or have it approved for experimental purposes, but then you got to get FAA approval to shoot the rocket off. Uh, to make sure it won't fly into the path of a plane or all this stuff. And I didn't do any of that. I just probably should have been arrested as a child for some of the stuff that I was shooting off. But here's what I think after digesting. I, by the way, I listened to him years ago. And now due to the fact that so many of you have asked me to, uh, you know, do a show on him and evaluate his fantastical claims. I've been listening to him again for the past several weeks. Um, the conclusion that I reached is that David Adair does not have even a high school level uh, understanding of either rocket technology, space technology, nuclear technology, or any technology. 
and especially not even a high school level physics or first year college student level knowledge of physics. I mean, these are fantastical, stupid claims that go against the very laws of physics. You can't go 100 times the speed of light without breaking the speed of light. And according to Einstein, you simply can't go faster than the speed of light. But he's going to tell you that he's such a genius, he's smarter than Einstein. And people are offering him $1,695 billion to develop his space technology, but he turns them down somehow. People are offering him $3 trillion to develop his space technology, but somehow he turned them down too. People offered him a billion dollars to develop his so-called thorium technology. He turned them down. It's, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. But what I believe truly after having evaluated this man and listened to his claims, and I've heard him tell this alien engine story at least 10 different times. And each time he does, the, the details change. In one version of the story, it was Curtis LeMay who took him to Area 51 and told him where to shoot the, his model rocket off. And he nailed it and landed it exactly where General Curtis LeMay, four-star general, wanted him to land it. In another version of this same exact story, it wasn't General Curtis LeMay that he was interacting with at Area 51. It was Werner von Braun, the famous Nazi paperclip scientist that would later become responsible and be, uh, for the space program at NASA. Uh, the details change as well. The alien engine at one point was described to be the size of a Volkswagen van. In another talk he gave years later, he said, no, it was the size of a school bus and he crawled on top of it and it was telepathic in nature. He adds details, take details away, details change. Friends, the details of a true story, if the story is truly true, generally don't change over time. But his story kept on changing, evolving. New bits were added. Old bits were taken away. Now we have no uh, Curtis LeMay. Instead, we have Werner von Braun, the famous rocket scientist, largely responsible for the success of NASA's Apollo program. So uh, I'm going to show you uh, David Adair's Facebook page because I think I have an understanding of what his true actual experience is. This is David Adair with a model rocket as a child. And uh, we have saw, we've seen earlier that in one of those videos, he literally had a child's toy model rocket in a box behind him. I find that extremely suspect, friends. And uh, his only proof is that he built a 10-foot rocket. Now, I'm here to tell you, friends, with enough stump remover and uh, sugar, I can create the same exact rocket in about... I don't know. It's been a long time since I built a rocket, especially a big one. But uh, if I had some carpet tubes, you know, those cardboard tubes that you get from uh, a roll of carpet and a few other things, some cardboard, some balsa wood, I could create this 10 foot rocket in a day, maybe two, including the engine to power that 10 foot rocket thousands of feet in the air. And I'm no Einstein. I'm no genius. So uh, good for him. As a child, he built a very big model rocket. Um, but I, I, I don't have a larger version of this that I could read to you, but I'm going to see if I can get it. So please bear with me. Uh, nowhere in this article is there any mention of a revolutionary uh, hydrogen powered or I'm sorry, there is no mention in this article of any revolutionary technology. In fact, it's very typical model rocket technology. It says, building a rocket, David Adair, 17, standing on the beach, and Dow Caldwell work on the rocket that is nearly 10 feet tall. I also just wanted to mention that as a rocket designer, he is a complete and total failure. Because according to this uh, article, his rocket is 230 pounds, this 10-foot rocket, which means he must have built it out of very heavy, I don't know, steel tubing or metal, titanium, I don't know. 
so what we have here is a, uh, a young person who likes building model rockets, big ones. And I was one of those kids. Here, the, the, uh, the article states, David, 17, you may recall, at, uh, at the Centerburg High School student who flew to Cape Kennedy for the first moonshot on July 15, 1959. He was a 15-year-old freshman. Because of his knowledge of space, David was able to talk easily with many persons, including Walter Cronkite. Here we have him again. Now he's talking to Walter Cronkite, in addition to General Curtis LeMay, in addition to Werner Von Braun. He's hobnobbing with all these famous people. Uh, he says, I had to toss out all dimensions for the smaller, dry, solid fuel rockets, said David. And by the way, this article goes on to state that this was a liquid-fueled rocket, which means typical 1950s, 1960s rocket technology. There was no revolutionary fusion-powered rocket engine in this, at least this example of a rocket that he built. So, yeah. Yeah. And here we say, it says, employing his mechanical knowledge, Adair has used a starter motor and a power steering pump, both from an old automobile, as part of the mechanism for creating the booster power to get the rocket off the ground. Uh, again, th this is a science nerd that's tinkering around in his garage or workshop. This is not a, a you know, Einstein level genius that is creating fusion technology. He's using junkyard parts in this example. Um, so, you know, I have a feeling that I may know really that his level of expertise and here's him with a former astronaut, as if that's somehow proof of his stories, Apollo 13 astronaut. But there are times when former astronauts give talks all over the country. They write a book. They do a book tour. They give talks and they sell their book and you can meet them. I've met several former astronauts uh, at events like that. This is not proof that he developed any of this groundbreaking technology. And neither is a picture of a model rocket or one newspaper article that somehow claims, you know, that this kid's some kind of, that he's some kind of whiz kid. Good for him, he was a whiz kid. But this specific, uh, you know, newspaper article is just, this is from 1971. Two, this is years and years after, let me share this. This is years and years after he claimed that he developed incredible top secret technology that the government came and sought him out for. Years and years after he created that technology and went to Area 51, he is now using old parts from a junkyard to make his new engine. And this is an article from 1971. Again, this makes absolutely no sense, friends. Why would you, if you 10 or 20 years prior had developed an engine so incredible it could go 100 times the speed of light, why would you be playing with junkyard parts and junk to make a 10-foot tall liquid-powered rocket? It makes absolutely no sense. You know, that would be like, I don't know, going back to uh, a Model a Model T if, after you've, you know, I've got a Lamborghini, but I, I'm, I'm going to forget about the Lamborghini and just drive around a, a you know, Model T or, or, you know, car from the 20s or 30s. It makes absolutely no sense. If you were in possession of exotic technology that advanced, that incredible, why would you go building your next rocket in the 70s out of junk from a junkyard? It, it, this, this alone proves that he's full of it. And that's what I got for you. What I believe is that David Adair was um, interested in model rockets as a child. And he built some big ones. Uh, but by the way, so did I. And so do many people. It doesn't make them an Einstein level genius that are somehow cracking. Let's see. Uh, thorium nuclear generators. He's cracking the code to that. 
He's cracking the code to breaking the speed of light. He said his engine could propel a craft to, to go 100 times the speed of light. He's getting offered billions of dollar deals and trillions of dollar deals, but he can't show us any of his incredible groundbreaking earth shattering technologies. And he has not a single patent to his name. His so-called company mentioned, I looked them up. They don't have a single patent to that company name. None of this makes any sense. Uh, and what we can do is circle back to my earlier assessment, which is if somebody's on Gaia TV, that's a pretty good indicator that they are a fairy tale bullshit artist storyteller with zero evidence, zero proof, and just a lot of stories, just like Corey Good. <clears throat> now, to those uh, who think that I didn't do enough work on this man, um, I, I just at some point think I don't want to waste my time and my energy on a bullshitter. You know, at some point, this man's claims get so ridiculous that they can just be picked apart easily by logic. Why would this man be working UFO conferences for a few hundred dollars to talk when he's getting offered three trillion dollar deals? You know, uh, it's just this whole this guy's whole story is ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. He's getting he's turning down trillion dollar deals so he can work go work the UFO circuit. Sure he is. And where's all this technology? Let me see it, David. And by the way, if David Adair wants to give me the names and telephone numbers of these billion dollar investors of his, I'll call them and verify they actually offered him, let's see, $1,695 billion. I'll call them and check. And this other group that somehow offered him $3 trillion, I'll call them and ask them if they actually offered him money. And this Texas billionaire, give me his name and phone number, and I will fact check you, David Adair. I'll go and ask him if he offered you a billion dollars. And if, you know, listen, sometimes people forget that uh, sometimes people are very unkind to me. They're like, well, you didn't prove that he didn't do these things. Well, listen, I am not the guy uh, that is making absolutely ridiculous claims. He is. It shouldn't be my job to disprove him or prove him a liar, even though we can easily do that uh, with logic. I mean, it's just simple. None of this makes any sense. Uh, and there is a principle. But one second, I'm trying to look it up right now because I don't want to misspeak. There is a principle uh, which essentially says that the amount, okay, it's called Bran, Brandolini's Law. <laughs> and you can look it up on uh, Wikipedia. And, and basically, Brandolini's Law states that the amount of energy needed to refute bullshit is an order of magnitude bigger than that needed to produce it. I'm not the one producing this garbage level of information and making these absolutely fantastical claims. So, you know, going forward, I'm going to try to not waste my time and energy. He's the one making these absolutely ridiculous claims. So I say the, the, the burden of proof is on him. I'm not making ridiculous claims like I'm getting $3 trillion deal offers to run space programs. And I'm also not making amateur hour mistakes telling people absolutely false information like we've never launched a nuclear generator or reactor into space. We absolutely have. Uh, he's no expert. I truly believe that he was just growing up, was the best time of his life, and he built a few big rockets and got a little bit of local media attention. I mean, after all, this is not the New York Times. Uh, this is Vernon, Ohio's Mount Vernon local newspaper. Um, and, you know, my thing really is that you know, I get upset when people start saying, I didn't prove that he's lying. Okay. All right. I didn't prove it. I, I can tell you that there's a very high likelihood that he's making this stuff up. After all, we listen to him talk. We listen to him talk for 28 minutes and 25 seconds. So we listened to him talk for a half hour. And in that half hour talk, he made a ridiculous amount of absolutely fantastical claims. 
and he offered zero proof for any of those absolutely fantastical claims. So instead of wasting my time trying to prove he's lying, I, I think that, like I said, the burden of proof is on him. Prove you're not a bullshitter, David Adair. Let me talk to all these famous people that you somehow interacted with. I don't think that's going to happen. And in fact, uh, David Adair won't probably release his three anonymous sources that are offering him billions of dollars and trillions of dollars to develop his groundbreaking technology. And likewise, David Adair is not very likely to show me some prototypes or you some prototypes or anybody some prototypes. Why show people proof that you can actually build these fantastical devices if you can just tell them stories about them? And this, my friends, is where we're at, and this is where we find ourselves. So we're almost two hours in. I want to take some time for the live chat. I'm sorry to go so long. Uh, let's have some interaction. Questions or comments for me, put them in all capital letters, or better yet, put them in a super chat. We like those. And while I'm on that subject, I want to remind you there's a few ways that you can support us here. The first uh, way, of course, is to throw money at us. There's instructions to do that in the in the description of this video. You can send us a uh, super chat down there in the live chat by smashing that money button. Um, you can send us a PayPal donation, cash app. You can become a Patreon supporter for as little as a dollar a month. Or you can become a channel member here for $5 a month and get all the Patreon benefits and more extra goodies. I'm a terrible salesperson. That's all I got as far as a pitch. Uh, so let's take some time and uh, deal with the live chat. I'm going to check in with those super chats. By the way, we read every single one of them, every show. We read every single uh, PayPal pledge that people send or Cash App pledge that people send. Let me get on over and uh, see if we have some super chats to read. And I, uh, you guys will have to forgive me for not getting them to them sooner. <laughs> okay, great. I'm going to share this right now uh, with my live audience. I'm sorry if I have not uh, didn't notice the super chats. So uh, we have a few to call out. Lord Ludicrous Plaid, longtime show supporter with a kind and generous $1.99 super chat. And it correctly points out that the National Security Act would have taken the rocket. Exactly. If he had any kind of technology that was nuclear in origin, if he was using nuclear fissionable material, whether it was thorium and could be turned into a, um, you know, a weapon or not, the National Security Act and the Atomic Energy Commission would come down on him like a hurricane and get that, and for the safety of the local community, you can't just play around with nuclear fissionable material. And by the way, you can't just get nuclear fissionable material. At least I don't believe you can. Uh, so th th that's another nonsensical statement that he makes uh, that makes absolutely no sense. We have Amy W.C. with a kind of generous. Oh, and by the way, I want to thank Lord Ludacris. Uh, Lord Ludacris Plaid, longtime show supporter, been with us a long time, always willing to throw a couple bucks. Always happy to see you. Thank you, Lord Ludacris. We have Amy WC with a kind and generous $10 super chat says, I've said it before. I will say it again. I would recognize your laugh among a thousand. Well done. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I used to be very self-conscious about my cackle, but here I just let it flow. And a lot of people say they like my laugh. And so I try to laugh here. Sometimes, Amy WC, I have to laugh just to keep myself from crying that I have to listen to this level of bull. It's ridiculous. I have to laugh at it. You have to laugh at this guy being this ridiculous and the balls on him. Somebody else mentioned it. What kind of balls does it take to stand up in front of hundreds of people and claim that you have all this revolutionary technology that nobody's allowed to see? and claim that you met all these famous people and interacted with them, but you have zero evidence or proof of it, and claim that people are offering you billion-dollar deals and trillion-dollar deals, but you're turning them down. The balls on this guy, I have to laugh at it. It's ridiculous. Uh, so we thank you, Amy WC, and recognize you for your kindness, your generosity, and support. It's only from the support of kind and generous people like Amy WC that we're able to continue in this journey. And we have UFO John Doe. Good to see you again, our uh, Super Chat MVP. 
always willing to throw a couple of bucks in the hat to help us along here. And we appreciate you and honor your pledge, UFO John Doe, a longtime show supporter. And he says, as a wise man said, this is where we find ourselves, surrounded by UFO hucksters, UFO fraudsters, and UFO circle jerking. Until next time, friends. Well, that's a great uh, actual imitation of me. Thank you, UFO John Doe. Uh, we definitely appreciate your kindness, your generosity, and your support. I'm going to go back over to the live chat. Uh, that's UFO John Doe's super chat. I'm sorry the others are pretty far back, so I'm probably not going to be able to be able to share them on the screen. It only lets me go so far back. I want to thank all of you for helping us to praise the cash. Uh, I think uh, that we have done our due diligence, and I, I understand that many of you I can't tell you how many people asked me to evaluate this man's claims and tell everybody what I thought about him. I've been putting it off because most of me thinks this guy is absolutely ridiculous. And I, I thought this is just too ridiculous. It's too, this is too stupid and childish. Like, do people really want to sit here for two hours and pick apart this guy's fantastical bull? Okay. But we aim to please here. So if you ask me to look, if enough people ask me to look into a certain individual in conspiracy land, we aim to please, we do it. So uh, we've done it. And I just want to mention that we were going to have a special guest. Um, we were going to have a special guest host tonight in the form of Nick Nope, as in, nope, I didn't run a British UFO program. Nope, I never investigated cattle mutilations for the British government. Nope, I, I never, ever. Uh, investigated crop circles for the British government. Nope, I didn't investigate anything related to UFOs for the British government. All I did was answer the phone. But anyway, uh, the mask for Nick Nope is done. It's beautiful. It's one of my best, some of my best work. Really looks good. Uh, but I want to get the, I wanted to get the voice down. And someone commented that a lot of my characters is basically the same weird voice. It's not different or distinct enough. So, hey, we aim to please. We're going to up my game. I'm working on an English accent, which I used to be able to do pretty well. Um, it, for a time, I wanted to be an actor, and uh, I liked to learn British accent, Irish accents, so that I could play any part that people asked me to. Um, but it's been years since I've done an English accent, and I recorded myself doing a screen test of Nick Nope, and it sounded totally terrible and off. So I want I want to uh, work on that before we have Nick Nope here. And we have UFO John Doe, a channel member and uh, Super Chat MVP with another uh, kind and generous 499 Super Chat. And absolutely uh, asking for a Trixie uh, to thank him for his kind and generous uh, Super Chat. And we aim to please, we'll do that. I've got some new ones here. Let me see. One second, friends, let me get to them. Can we squeeze in Trixie? No, oh, and isn't that interesting? I have two brands here full of uh, videos uh, and other bumpers that I can play. And one of them has a different theme, I suppose. So sorry for that. Let me see. All right, let's have Trixie. Thank you, FO John Doe, for his kind and generous super chat. Much appreciated. Thank you for helping us to battle between the space Zulus and the Anchor. So I got out my telescope to investigate this planet. Unfortunately, it just turned out to be a simple bar brawl in Philadelphia. Back to you, Stephen. <laughs> Thank you, UFO John Doe, and thank you, uh, Trixie Luce, our UFO uh, news desk correspondent, who happens to be an out-of-work stripper, uh, and you, uh, he's absolutely right, the Sixth Sense pointing out, you could buy Intel Lady Trixie a coffee, and you can pledge there. Thank you for sharing that. I keep, I'm a terrible show host. I got a Sixth Sense, remind me, I have to copy Carrie, um, Carrie's show, that one time I got abducted by aliens into the video descriptions and also and that would be spooky carrie and also uh intel ladies channel i want to copy it so that we can tell people they can support them from the video description right <laughs> visitor says 
She looks like she has a nice pair of personalities. Hey, I think they looked great tonight. I, I mean, she looked great tonight, okay? <laughs> Only on Truth Seekers do we give you out-of-work strippers uh, being the UFO News Desk correspondents. This is the only place we can get it. I'm surprised somebody hasn't ripped off that idea yet. Um, you know, one of the things that's starting to piss me off is that some of these other show hosts, if they ever had an original idea, it would die of loneliness. Uh, it's terrible. Yes, Trixie is local talent wreaking havoc. She's, um, she's from Club Oz in Philadelphia. Go look that up. <laughs> Uh, Mystery Eon is here and says, I want to see Trixie and the Melons. Steve bought her. Well, I rent her, you know, I rent the Melons. We don't, you know, and by the way, that reminds me, I gotta send, send her some money. Uh, absolutely. Okay, Amy Collins says, As far as I know, <laughs> oh my god, that's wonderful. Amy Collins is saying. This is unconfirmed, but this is why we love our interactive chats, because sometimes our live chat has information that I'm not aware of. Amy Collins says, as far as I know, David Adair worked at NASA Johnson Space Center cafeteria in the early 1990s. I missed out. Did Stephen mention this? No, I didn't. And if that's true, I'm going to look that up. I'm going to try to find that, Amy. If you have any information or where you found that or where I could read that, Please email me at truthseekershow at gmail.com because if that's true, uh, that explains an awful lot. And maybe he's just some space nerd that's not really smart enough to invent all this shit, but invented some crazy fantasy in his head where, you know, that's one thing about pathological liars. Uh, we can look up the signs of pathological liars. Um, and one of the things, uh, the signs or symptoms of a pathological, excuse me, pathological liar are they lie to gain something. They exaggerate things. They keep on changing their stories. We've mentioned his story keeps changing and changing and changing. And they live in a false sense of reality. If confronted, they act defensive and never admit that they are liars. Lastly, they hold no value for truth. Yeah, I, I think that Mr. David Adair is a pathological liar. Uh, his story keeps changing. We've talked about that. He's lying to get something, which is fame, fortune, and money in the UFO circuit. Yes, the Sixth Sense is if someone has a male performer artist, for, so the ladies or others have someone like Trixie, please email truthseekers, truthseekershow at gmail.com. We're still looking for a male model that can do uh, something for the ladies. Um, you guys don't want me to have to take my shirt off. That would be gross. Uh, you know, I'm going to start a um, OnlyFans, but on my OnlyFans, people are going to pay me to keep my clothes on, right? <laughs> and my father used to say I had a great face for radio. Yes. So, listen, uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. We're over this terrible Internet hump. For those that are aware, I had four days with no Internet with two children home for the summer. That was a nightmare. And all I got was uh, this lousy headache, uh, which slowly started to go away today as the Internet, your yesterday, I should say, as the Internet uh, got turned back on yesterday. Um, and it's also important to point out that I'm not sure what our schedule is going to be like for the next three weeks. And the reason for that is that my oldest son, some of you know, is nonverbal autistic. We had him in a summer program since school let out almost. I think he had one or two weeks off, and then he's been in a summer program for autistic children. But that ended today. So next week, I got two boys, and it is going to sound like a herd of elephants in this house, a 10-year-old and a 6-year-old, uh, two boys running around for the next three or four weeks. So I'm not sure what the show schedule is going to be like. I may have to just do a couple of shows a week uh, just to keep things going until uh, my schedule clears. And, and certainly in September when they both go back to work, or actually I, I hear it's late August from um, my lovely wife, uh, you know, I'll have so much more time. In fact, as soon as they're back to school, we're going to begin doing uh, an afternoon show on certain topics. We've haven't decided yet and the usual night shows 
We're going to pick up the pace here. Oh, and uh, we want to thank NVS5150 for the kindness, generosity, and support. Uh, it is much, much appreciated. Uh, and we will have Trixie, thank you for your kind uh, and generous donation. NV5150, thank you for your kindness. This is Trixie from Truths in Your Self Down. <laughs> thank you, Trixie. And thank you, NV5150, for your kindness, your generosity, and your support. Um, by the way, I should also mention that because of the internet outage, I wasn't able to post the, the August, for the first time in two years, I was not able to post the August 2022 backstage show journal, where I talk about things going on behind the scenes and what happened during the month. And um, I'm going to do that and get that on Patreon and on our member section as soon as possible. Um, I also want to thank Anthony from Unidentified S4. You may have been here for our debut of another piece of this larger project, Is This the Face of Bigfoot? We're very close now to doing almost a documentary style, long form, it might be three hours when we're done, uh, on Todd Standing and his so-called Bigfoot evidence. Um, let us know what you think of that series uh, and we will continue it. And I've had, I'm going to share this as well. Um, Eric, the awakening man, uh, I've known him for a long time. He is a fixture in conspiracy land. Eric travels all over the country to every UFO conference, every conspiracy conference, Bigfoot stuff. Um, and he has encouraged me to continue looking into Bigfoot. Uh, and maybe I'll do that because it would appear that Eric got burned out of UFOs and all the fakers and frosters. So he started delving deep into the world of Bigfoot. Now, I can't listen. I'm not going to uh, comment on the authenticity of these photos. But Eric, the Awakening Man, sending me these, he says, they're real at Stephen Cambion. By the way, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Stephen Cambion on Twitter best way to know about shows and what's going on. So he says, they're real Stephen Cambian. It's safe to go down this rabbit hole. Now, this, of course, is uh, a bunch of sketches of Bigfoot, which I don't find very... Yeah, I'm sorry, Eric. I don't find this first one very interesting or compelling. Now, this other one, I'd like to know more about these photographs that you're posting. Is this the face of Bigfoot? Looks better than Todd Standing's Bigfoot. Uh, photos, but it looks like this could be a photo manipulate. To me, this one looks like it could be a Photoshop manipulated image of a chimpanzee uh, that somebody added more human-like features to. That's my take. I, I'd like to know more about where this photo comes from. Um, and uh, he's got a few more here. Now, that one looks really good, but it looks like it could be CGI to me. Again, Eric, I need to know the sources of where you're getting this stuff from. And some Bigfoot uh, website is not really going to tell me much. But these are some pictures of Bigfoot he, he sent in. Thanks, to Eric o Awakening Man. And uh, also, uh, I'm going to talk to Eric and see. He goes all over the country. We're going to see if we can't get him to start doing um, videos of these UFO conferences and some of the speakers or interviewing people for us. I'd really like that, Eric, if you're interested in helping here and being like a roving conspiracy land reporter, since you're already at these things, I'd really uh, like and appreciate that. Uh, Moonlick says, hey, Stephen, welcome back to society. Yeah, four days without internet. Uh, geez. Mystery Eon says, my dad is obsessed with great North American ape as it is now classified. Yeah, uh, that's great. NVTV is a YouTube channel dedicated to Bigfoot. Interesting to watch. Take with a grain of salt, though. Uh, I think we had NVTV. Uh, oh, no, that was somebody else. Uh, NV5150 may be related, though, with the kind of generous super chat. I'll check out. Uh, Bigfoot is... Some of you know. I'm going to see if I can show you something. I uh, I love Bigfoot. I, I don't know what it is about it. Uh, there's just something about Bigfoot that I have always loved. And I uh, at the cabin, we have a bunch of Bigfoot stuff. Uh, in fact, I showed in today's premiere a metal 
cutout of a Bigfoot. I'm going to share that on my screen here. One second here. Let me see if I can't get that to share with you. Right on the right on the the door of my cabin uh, is a Bigfoot, a Sasquatch. And I can't tell you how many people stop walking the road with their dogs or something. Uh, we don't get many people go by the cabin. But when they do, they stop and double take at this Sasquatch image on my cabin door. Uh, oh, no, that's the, uh, the sunroom. There was another photo. There you go. A little closer up. Right on my cabin door. I'm a big fan of Bigfoot. Uh, you know, I'd really love it to be real. I really, really would love Bigfoot to be real. Um, but I think a lot like UFOs, the evidence uh, for Bigfoot is largely suspect. Uh, but that doesn't stop me from listening to podcasts about Bigfoot, from watching documentaries about Bigfoot. Um, big fan of Bigfoot. You know, what can I say? See, Laugh is here, uh, or is it Caliph? is here and says there's no way that a super clear photo is real i mean it would have to be a scenario where they could have gotten a bunch of additional photos if it is clear yeah i i've never seen a very clear photo of bigfoot uh in fact when you do see a clear photo of bigfoot people instantly say that looks fake right the mystery eon says north american ape or nape is a term coined by lauren coleman in the 1960s to refer to cryptid primates of north america which he believes to be distinct from bigfoot Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know about that one. I know about the skunk ape in Florida. Uh, and I know about the Yeti. I know about uh, the Orang Pendek in Indonesia. And uh, there is the Yowie in Australia. There is the famous abominable snowman, the Yeti, in uh, parts of Asia. Uh, but I've never heard of a nape. I'll have to look that one up. <laughs> Cosmic Neighbor says, I have a Bigfoot stent, so I'll give you when I come by your cabin. Ron, I don't know what you're doing this weekend, but this weekend will be a great time for you to come and visit because it's supposed to rain all weekend. And uh, I can work on some finishing work that I have inside the cabin. But my wife, I think, has decided that she's not going. So I'll have an empty cabin to myself uh, and plenty of room. And this weekend would be good stay in the cabin you can stay in the sunroom or you can stay in the in the trailer uh next to the cabin you're always welcome but i if you do come i'm gonna bring that 3d printer and and beat you up until you get it working right by the way uh ron i am trying the settings that you had mentioned um i know you guys are tired of hearing about 3d printing but uh, you know uh, i'm too lazy to actually call ron or email him so he's here I'm just going to tell them that I turned up the I turned up the the nozzle temperature to 210. I turned the fan speed down to 90 percent. Somebody suggested that that stringiness I'm getting is because the nozzle's not hot enough, and that the fan is set too high, so it's cooling down too fast. I'm running it right now with suggested settings from both you and a friend. Uh, I'm trying to print this little computer case. We'll see this little Amiga computer case. So, And what pisses me off, Ron, is I have all the parts to build that, an Amiga emulation system with a Raspberry Pi, including it looks like a little keyboard computer. And, but I don't have the uh, case, which is what I bought the 3D printer to make. And so far now. Cosmic Neighbor says, leave the fan at 100%. Well, I tried it at 205, and it didn't print it right. So I'll try that next, I guess. I'm just going to keep trying stuff until I dial in the settings right. But r what concerns me, Ron, is that this may be specific to each thing you're printing, those settings. Because I've printed some other stuff that came out great. I printed a Nightwing mask for my son. Uh, he loves Batman and Robin and Nightwing and the whole Batman family and Batgirl and Batwoman and all that. Batwing, he loves Batman. So uh, last year for Halloween, he was Batman and I was Robin. That's how much he uh, loves Batman and Robin. But I printed him, a, he wanted a Nightwing mask, and they don't really sell. Well, I guess they do, but I was like, I, I can make you one. And we made him a Nightwing mask. 
came out perfect. And that was with 200 degrees, 60 on the bed, and 100% fan speed. That mask came out great. These computer cases I'm trying to make, uh uh-uh. There's Pragmagic. Uh, Pragmagic, when you get a chance, I want you to message me because I have some interesting things that I need to tell you. Oh, uh, two things, too. Before uh, before I sign off for the night, there's two very important things that I want to just mention. The first is that yesterday I hit 60 days without alcohol. And, uh, yeah, Pragmagic being here uh, somehow reminded me of drinking and, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, but we all have our struggles. I, uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to continue forever. But I have successfully, as of yesterday, completed 60 days with absolutely no alcohol. Um, And here's what I can tell you. I have more energy. I am uh, more productive. I am a better father these past 60 days than I have been for some time. Listen, you can't take care of two children all hungover and pissed off. I mean, you can, but it's not going to go as well. And you're not going to have as high... And also, my level of patience has increased tremendously since I've not consumed alcohol for the 60 days. Um, As far as health-wise, I feel better. Uh, And I've lost, I think I've lost 9 or 10 pounds already of that pandemic comfort food weight that many of us put on or drinking too much during the pandemic weight, whatever the case may be. Uh, down 10 pounds. I don't, I don't see any downside of the uh, 60 days without drinking. Um, I mean, uh, you you know, yeah, I'm a little, uh, high strung and alcohol has always helped me to sort of shut my mind down, but I'm finding that, uh, I, I just needed to find better, healthier ways to do that. Like meditation. I have also, since quitting drinking, returned to my study and practice of meditation. And I've also opened myself up to all forms of meditation, where before I I strictly stuck to Buddhist meditation and Buddhist meditative principles. Um, Now I'm looking into transcendental meditation and and other forms of meditation. Um, Yeah, so I, I see absolutely no downside of uh from the 60 days but i can't listen uh anybody that has problems with alcohol has has faced this this sort of problem which is can i moderate my drinking can i can i go back to drinking occasionally can i have two beers and go to bed instead of having 12 beers and passing out i'm still unsure uh and some of you know, I have mentioned that my mother was uh, really, you know, alcoholic, absolutely, positively alcoholic. Uh, she died of alcohol-related illness, which is uh, sclerosis of the liver and, and liver failure at the end. Um, she's an old Irish lady. She liked her whiskey and her beer. And she drank every day. And I found myself starting to drink every day. And it, isn't it interesting that even after watching... Uh, a very close family member suffer and die from alcohol. I still chose to use alcohol. I, I don't understand this. And I don't understand if, uh, I don't really, un- I don't know. I don't know if I can go back to moderating. Right. And some people may say, or in my position decide it's just safer not to drink at all than to tr- attempt moderation because I've been down this road before. I once quit for uh, drinking for like six months or almost a year. And then I went back to occasional drinking. But then during the pandemic, that drinking on the weekends, you know, maybe once, twice on a, you know, some weekends turned into I would drink every day. Uh, Some of that was due to my business being in the shitter. I'm sure I was depressed. I was self-medicating. I was running away from my problems instead of facing them head on. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of people have faced these issues. So I haven't decided if I can go back to moderate drinking or if I will just continue abstaining from alcohol 100%. Um, 
I'll try to make that decision. But I can tell you this, if I should go back to, if I should decide I'm going to occasionally drink and then I start drinking every day again, I'm done. I'm just going to totally abstain. I'll go back to nothing. Um, you know, you know how some people, some people can do that. You know, you know what I would love to do? I would love to go to a really good Irish bar uh, that has great draft beer and just drink some great, wonderful draft beers, right? Or have a couple of big pints of Guinness, ice cold Guinness or black and tan, uh, you know, or, or craft beers. I'd love to be the kind of person that could go to a bar and have two and stop. But uh, at least after the pandemic started and my business got destroyed, like many people, I got sort of depressed and I needed, I guess I needed to self-medicate. And, uh, you know, I would justify, well, I'm, I'm not working tomorrow. I can drink. I'm not working tomorrow. But I was still taking care of children, which is not not the best situation, being all hungover trying to deal with children. I don't recommend it. It doesn't. <laughs> and, you know, <clears throat> unfortunately, those children don't care if you're hungover. Uh, or, you know, also, I found that I am spending more time and doing more things with my children. So in other words, when I was drinking every day, uh, I would just sit in the house with them. I'm not taking you anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. It's enough that I'm watching you and taking care of you. I'm not taking you to the park. I'm not taking you out to ride your bike. I don't care. I'm not even taking you in the yard. I don't care. Um, but I found now that I have, uh, you know, sober every day, I'm feeling so much better that I am taking the children outside more. We're doing things more or even just I think I'm even just spending more time with them. Where before, I would do my best to sit on the couch and ignore them until their mother came home, honestly, being all hungover and pissed off and not in a great mood. Uh, now, you know, playing more games with my son and, and doing more things. Uh, all in all, anyway, I just wanted to mention 60 days with no alcohol. I'm feeling very good. Not sure what the future holds for me. Uh, I'll have to make that decision. I have not made the decision that I will continue with no alcohol for the rest of my life or indefinitely or whatever. Uh, and for those that have asked, um, yes, I have attended Alcoholics Anonymous meetings during this 60 day period. Yesterday they gave me a 60 day chip uh, and a round of applause. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know about that either. Um, the, I think that for some people, Alcoholics Anonymous can be extremely helpful. Um, but I also think that for some people, it becomes a religion. It becomes very cult-like. I'm talking to people that go to four meetings a day. That means four hours a day sitting at Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, talking about and listening to people that have alcohol problems. It's almost as if some people replace one, you know, habit with another habit. Now, is it a healthier habit? I mean, the jury's out. I, I you know, sometimes... And one thing I've noticed about the Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, I'm going to the same place. It's right near my home. And uh, by the way, they're all very, very nice people. So I, I can't say anything disparaging about the people that I've met. They've all been very nice, very supportive. They gave me a, Everybody gave me a list of everybody's phone numbers. So if I'm having trouble or I want to talk to somebody, there's a whole list of people. All very nice people. But, uh, you know... The, some of these meetings are run by people that don't think things through. Like one of the meetings was, what would you do today if it was your last day on earth? Everybody in there was thinking the same thing. I'm going to drink my head off. It's the last day on earth, right? It does, that is not helpful. It doesn't make any sense. So I find myself almost wanting to like get a list of who's running the meetings. If it's somebody that talks about things that I find helpful, I want to go. But if not, I, I don't want to go. So uh, I'm supposed to do 90 meetings in 90 days too, but I haven't. I'm up to 60 days and maybe, I don't know, I go twice or three times a week, sometimes four if I have the time and I feel like it. Uh, one thing that uh, this AA meetings have been helpful to me is that I don't like to waste time. So for me, 
Any day that I go to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting and sit there for an hour, I don't drink because I've invested an hour of my time into staying sober that day. I might drink tomorrow when I don't go to a meeting, but today I went to a meeting, I'm not drinking. Um, and it's also interesting that I thought that I would be absolutely uh, neurotic with cravings for alcohol. And I'm, I'm really not. Uh, I'm starting to feel like at peace. Uh, but I will say that there have been a few times where I was looking at the clock going, it's 1 a.m. I could still go get a 12 pack today. They don't, the bar doesn't close near me. The bar is open until 2 a.m. I could still go get a six pack. So every day, I, I want you to say a prayer for me at 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. that I stay in my house and don't take a walk to the bar and continue uh, to remain sober for a while, at least a while longer. I think I've decided that I'm at least going to do another 30 days and, and then I'll be at 90 days and reevaluate my situation. Uh, yeah, so that's all I have to say. And if you are uh, somebody that suffers from similar problems, I'd be happy to talk to you or help you to take the steps that I did to get this far. Uh, I'm certainly no expert, though, and there's probably much better people for you to talk to, but I'm open and willing to help anybody that's uh, similarly afflicted by uh, the demon alcohol. Um, and there is one other thing which I would like to point out. And uh, one second, let me get my uh, get my bumper ready here. Let me see. We have to go back to the other one. There we go. Oh, I don't know how to do this. No. All right. I, I'm just gonna share my screen then. Today, we passed a major milestone here at Truth Seekers, and I am very, very proud of this. Uh, let's see. If you go to our About section, you will see that we joined YouTube in March of 2020. However, we didn't do the first show until June of 2020. But uh, just, I think last night, actually, we hit half a million views and i can't tell you how proud i am of that accomplishment that's no joke half a million views i don't know if i mentioned but you know i have somebody in my life that was talking shit behind my back about my show and i don't remember when the last time half a million people showed up to watch them or listen to them do anything so I'm extremely proud of that accomplishment. And we didn't lie to you. We didn't sell you fake stories. We didn't use fake alien pictures claiming they're real. We didn't use fake UFO whistleblowers with no evidence. We did this the honest way, the honest, the most honest way that I know possible. We try to give you the facts, the evidence. We're not here selling you, you know, fairy tales. So to me, that is a major, major accomplishment. And I will always be proud of that. I want to thank Spooky and Sixth Sense and B Baker and all of you uh, really for your help. And I want to thank each and every guest that we've had in this two year run. Um, I would really, I really, really appreciate it, everybody, because it, it's, it's been like a, a volunteer effort to get us this far. You know, we don't pay guests. We don't have funds for that. And uh, Many people have volunteered to do things. We've got, uh, you know, Intel Lady, I want to thank as well, uh, who has helped us uh, an incredible amount of, uh, of times to increase the production of our show. We have Spooky, who does those incredible edits and the great, great graphics that I can't do because I suck at that. You know, uh, it's always good to recognize your weaknesses and fill them with an expert. And uh, we're happy to have Spooky and we have Six Sense and B Baker holding down the, the live chat for us. Uh, half a million views. What an incredible accomplishment. So I wanted to mention that, I believe, on Saturday night, because we're behind this week on show. So this Saturday night, uh, I believe at 9 p.m. Yes, 9 p.m. Normal time for us, 9 p.m. So this Saturday night, we'll be doing a half a million views celebration. And you're welcome to come. But I would like everybody to show up in some kind of costume just to make it fun. We're going to make it a costume ball. And everybody is welcome. Please wear headphones. I'll be giving out the link to the, the, to the join the show. 
Everybody is welcome to come here Saturday night, 9 p.m. We'll have our half a million dollar, uh, or excuse me, I wish that we'd made half a million. <laughs> that was a Freudian slip, right? I'm thinking half a million dollars. Oh, no, we've hit half a million views on YouTube. UFO John Doe, uh, if you're buff enough, I get. It. I would love it. We got to get something for the ladies because I'm tired of them going, where's the hot dude for us every time we play that? Email me at truthseekershow at gmail.com. UFO John Dell with kind and generous dollar ninety nine. Thank you for your kindness, your generosity, and your support. Actually, Ryan, we don't want to make anybody sick, though. You know, no, I'm just busting his balls. I don't care who does it. I'm not taking my shirt off uh, on a live stream or even a. a rec- I'm just not taking my shirt off, not until I lose probably ten more pounds. By the way, that's certainly another benefit. I'm getting slimmer uh, through my uh, abstinence of alcohol. And, uh, and you, you know, my wife, she cracks me up sometimes. She told me that since I've lost this weight, about 10 pounds, it's much easier on her when I pound her. Isn't that a nice thing for your wife? To, oh, thank you. It's so much easier on you when I pound you. Thanks. That's what my wife says to me. Yeah. Moonlick says beer bellies go quick. Not quick enough. On 60 days, I thought it would be gone. Last time I quit drinking Moonlick, it melted right off. It melted right off. I didn't have to change my diet. Now I'm eating low carb, high. I'm eating a lot of vegetables and fruit. I'm not eating any processed food and I'm not eating almost no carbs, nothing. So like, uh, for example, for dinner, Today, I made a beef and vegetable stir fry, but for my my kids and my wife, you put it on a bed of rice. I just eat the, the beef and the vegetables, and I'm not eating the rice. I'm not eating any mashed potatoes. I'm not eating any Twinkies or Oreos or whatever. Low carb and no beer. I thought it would melt right off. It hasn't yet, but, you know, here we are. So uh, UFO John Doe, email me at truthseekershow at gmail.com. Uh, All right, so, uh, yeah, sugar. Maybe I should cut the sugar next. The only thing that I have that has sugars in it, in it is hot tea in the morning, iced tea most of the day, but I'm trying to cut the amount of sugar I'm putting in that, both of those, and I have a glass of chocolate milk at bedtime. That helps me sleep. Um, and I guess a glass of chocolate milk every day may not be that healthy for you because of all the sugar, but it's a hell of a lot healthier than a 12-pack of beer. So, you know... Uh, we're doing harm reduction here. Mark D. Truthseeker says, there is damn fine research being done uh, for the personal points of view expressed here, whether you agree or not, respect the research. Thank you, Mark D. Truthseeker. We we appreciate we appreciate your your kindness and, and your support. Wes says, congrats. Thank you all. Uh, I, I'm feeling very good. I'm going to continue in this abstinence of alcohol journey and see where it leads me. Like I said, I still haven't decided. I, I uh, Part of me would love to be able to occasionally drink, but I would like to keep it to, I don't know, uh, once every few weeks, not even every weekend uh, anymore, you know? And uh, instead of drinking a 12 pack, maybe I'll just drink a six pack every few weeks, not any more than that. I I don't know how to navigate this. It's It's a strange, strange demon to, you know. And then there are some friends of mine who are staunchly recovery. They're in recovery. I have a few friends that are in recovery and have been for years, and they all told me, you can't train a dragon. Don't even try it, Stephen. Just keep going on the good path you're on. So I have a lot to think about it. Carnation Instant Breakfast is delicious. (laughs) I used to drink that every day at my sad cubicle job. It made my day a little more, you know, less shitty, uh, Mark D. True Seekers. All right. Everybody keeps asking me this. Visitor is asking, do you recommend any UFO people to follow research that are credible that you know of? Uh, There is a Facebook feed uh, on my Facebook right now. I mentioned that I like um, I like John from the Black Vault. He never seems to uh, be selling fairy tales. So I like his work. Uh, And I also like uh, Jeremy Rye's Alien Scientist, though. 
Jeremy gets a little deep in the weeds for me with the with the protons and the science, very deep into the science. Uh, but in general, I like and respect Jeremy, and his work is very, very credible. He's not out there selling fairy tales either. Uh, let me see. Let me see if I can find this. And somebody chimed in uh, with people that I also agree with. Uh, Danny Miller has offered uh, a few suggestions. Uh, let me see if I can't get to them. One second, friends. I want to share this. Uh, and this was a Facebook feed. Let me see if we can find it now. Oh, yeah, here it is somewhere. Danny Miller says, there are a bunch of wonderful archivist types, but I can't think of any UFO personality that I trust. Um, and Danny Miller also says, Paul Dean and Keith uh, Basterfield in Australia are very credible. David Marler, triangle expert, is credible in my opinion, but he will appear on questionable TV shows on occasion. I can't fault him for trying to get some good info out there. Uh, and then, of course, Rob Hipkiss has mentioned Jeff uh, Kingsbury, Strange Recon, and Paul Sinclair as one of the good guys. So they're a starting point for you. I would, I would probably recommend all of those that we have mentioned. Um, my the general rule that you can you can see works is that the more famous a UFO celebrity is and the more money they make, the more full shit they are. That's been my general experience. Uh, your mileage may vary. Let me know what you guys think. And if you do know any credible researchers, please share it in the live chat so that everybody can check out and benefit from the non fairy tale hucksters. Uh, and Cosmic Neighbor says, thanks for no shout out. I'm going to break your freaking 3D printer. Oh, well, shout out to Cosmic Neighbors. Don't break it. What are you going to do? You're going to make it work any less shitty than it already works, uh, Cosmic Neighbors? Ron, I don't care. Do what you're going to do. Yeah. So uh, that's what else can I say, friends? Uh, as far as David Adir. I'm not going to waste any more time on that guy. If anybody wants me to, they have to bring me his proof and evidence first for me to evaluate before I'm willing to listen to any more fairy tales from that guy. Uh, it, he's just ridiculous and childish and stupid. And and the fact that he is spouting absolutely fake information out of his mouth, like we've never launched a nuclear reactor into space. Yes, we have. Uh, go look it up. You know? some expert but this is where we're at and this is where we find ourselves in a world surrounded by ufo hucksters fairy tale fairy tale artists bullshitters uh fakers fraudsters and more um and that's kind of uh, where we've been finding ourselves if anybody has any new people for us to look into you can always email me at truthseekershow at gmail.com can't guarantee that I'll have time or the interest to look into everyone, but we try to we try to uh, do what the audience wants here. So we do have some new stories we're developing and things that I will be bringing you. And we'll be back tomorrow night at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and Saturday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for our half a million views masquerade costume ball. And if you don't have a costume just put on a tinfoil hat or something festive and show up and be a part of the stream. Uh, we would appreciate that. So that's all I got for you, friends. Until next time, my name is Stephen Cambion. Good night and God bless all of you.
Hey there. Uh, sorry to bounce back in here, but we always read and thank every single super chat. And the High Lonesome uh, has blessed us with a kind and generous $20 super chat pledge. And we want to thank them for their kindness and their generosity and for helping us to praise the cash. Thank you, High Lonesome. It is much, much appreciated. Um, what can I say? There are generous people all over the world that are helping us to praise the cash, friends. Thank you, High Lonesome. Very, very generous of you. All right. Now I'm really out of here. Good night, friends.